History is often relegated to a list of names and places and dates. However, the reality is that history is about real people with many of the same struggles faced today. The stories of the past connect us with those who came before. Bartholomew County historian Susanna Jones knew that and wanted to convey to everyone that history can be fun and engaging. In 1985, she wrote an excellent book that covered the first 60 years since our county's founding. Obviously, then as now, there is so much history to document, it would be impossible to capture everything. Still, every story has a beginning, and as Susanna's title states, in our case, it began with Bartholomew. General Joseph Bartholomew was born in 1766. In 1798, Bartholomew brought his family to the newly created Indiana Territory. He gained fame as a military officer, and this is where he met General John Tipton. Both fought at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811 against a powerful Native American alliance formed by the Shawnee leader Tecumseh. However, it was his brother Tenskwatawa that led the forces into battle against his brother's wishes. The Native forces suffered a devastating loss that would have repercussions for decades. Bartholomew and Tipton served in the Indiana State Legislature together and were two of the ten commissioners chosen to select the site of the new state capital, which would become the city of Indianapolis. Though they were of different political parties, Tipton introduced the 1821 legislation to name the newly formed Bartholomew County after his commander and friend. The generals were no different from any other white inhabitants at that time and believed they were more civilized than the Native Americans. Tipton and Bartholomew spent their military careers fighting indigenous peoples and negotiating often lopsided treaties that allowed white settlers to claim these lands. While some of these actions by our ancestors are cruel by today's standards, we must put them into the context of their times. Should men like Bartholomew and Tipton be held up as heroes? Should they be viewed as villains on the wrong side of history? Or perhaps both? Current and future generations will decide those important questions. Although Bartholomew County was founded in 1821, the area was inhabited much earlier. The first people to live on this land are known as pre-contact Native Americans who lived in America before the Europeans arrived. These Native people moved seasonally and lived along waterways used for agriculture and transportation. Archaeological evidence supports the presence of Native people in the area at least 3,000 years ago. In the late 18th and early 19th century, the tribes of the Miami, Delaware, and Potawatomi lived in Indiana. The Delaware tribe in particular lived along the banks of the Flat Rock River and Clifty Creek, both of which run through Bartholomew County. In 1794, the Battle of Fallen Timbers near Toledo, Ohio, led to the Miami tribe abandoning their lands in Ohio to the U.S. government and moving west into what would become central and eastern Indiana. Over the next 25 years, a variety of skirmishes, raids, and treaties resulted in the native people losing almost all of their land in this area. The Battle of Tippecanoe occurred in Indiana in 1811 when future U.S. President William Henry Harrison and his troops defeated the Confederation of Native Americans, forcing the Native Americans to cede more land. Two of Harrison's fellow Indian fighters at the Battle of Tippecanoe were Joseph Bartholomew and John Tipton both of whom would later be involved in early Indiana politics and were instrumental in the founding of Bartholomew County. Tipton and Bartholomew would be part of skirmishes with the natives throughout the region. One such incident occurred in 1813 when Tipton led an attack on the Delaware near the East Fork of the White River just south of Bartholomew County. Although this was not a large conflict, a monument to what became known as the Battle of Tipton's Island stands in Jackson County on private property near the banks of the river. The two men were working on orders from the government to rid the area of Indians and soon came north through the future Bartholomew County on an Indian raid. John Tipton traveled through the area several more times in the following years and while camping along the Driftwood River, he wrote in his journal, this is good land, good water, and good timber. The good water Tipton was probably referring to was the area at the confluence of the Driftwood and Flat Rock Rivers. Within Bartholomew County, the Driftwood River flows south from the northwest, and the Flat Rock River flows from the northeast. 
The two rivers meet near the middle of the county, forming the East Fork of the White River. South of Columbus, Hawk Creek joins the East Fork of the White River, and farther south, Clifty Creek and Big Sand Creek connect with the waterway as well. Today, the confluence can be seen near downtown Columbus at Millrace Park. John Tipton's personal journal entry recognized that the waterways, forest, and rich land that had attracted Native people to the area would be attracted to white settlers as well. Indiana became the 19th state admitted to the Union on December 11, 1816. This map from 1817 to 1818 shows the settled areas in southern Indiana with vast areas of northern Indiana still occupied by Native tribes and only 20 of the eventual 92 counties organized. With the Treaty of St. Mary's in 1818, the U.S. government forced the Miami and other tribes to vacate a large section of land in central Indiana and opened up much of the state to settlement. The land ceded in the treaty became known as the New Purchase. This new territory meant the U.S. government could start selling the property to new settlers. The land that would become Bartholomew County was surveyed in 1819 and put up for sale at land offices in Jeffersonville and Brookville at an initial cost of $1.25 per acre. The land sales were brisk, and by 1820, at least 198 men had purchased land. In 1821, another 111 men and at least one woman became Bartholomew County landowners. These early land purchases were for areas all over the county except the far western edge. The parcels of land around the Driftwood and Flat Rock Rivers were generally most popular due to their suitability for farming. Not until after 1830 were the western and southwestern areas of the county settled. In 1819, John Tipton was among a small group of men who purchased county land before official sales began. As a member of the Indiana State Legislature, Tipton introduced the legislation for this area to become a county and be named for his friend, fellow soldier and legislator, General Joseph Bartholomew. The act was passed, and on January 9, 1821, Bartholomew County became the 36th county in Indiana. Tipton later sold some of the land he had purchased to be used for the county seat, and the county commissioners named it Tiptona in his honor. However, just a few weeks later, the name was changed to Columbus. There is speculation, but no evidence as to why the name was changed, and there are no original maps that show the county seat with its temporary name. John Tipton did not stay in Columbus, but instead moved north of Indianapolis, where another Indiana county and its county seat bear his name. He also later served in the U.S. Senate. Joseph Bartholomew moved his family from southern Indiana to Illinois. With the threat of interactions with the native population nearly gone, the first permanent settlers started to arrive in 1819. Joseph and Mary Cox and their family, including several adult children with families of their own, moved into the area called the Hall Patch, which was the land between the Flat Rock River and Hall Creek. The Hall Patch and Hall Creek were named for the numerous Hall trees growing there. Joseph Cox built his first cabin near Hall Creek, where today the intersection of Rocky Ford and Marr Road is located. In 1820, the Joseph Cox family purchased 1,300 acres of land for $1,625. Several of Joseph Cox's original land grant certificates exist, including this one dated 1821, which reflects the purchase of 80 acres near the original Cox cabin. As was typical of all land grant documents in the United States before 1830, it was signed by the U.S. President, James Monroe. Cox and his family cleared the first county road and built a grist or flour mill near the rocky ford across Hall Creek. This mill lasted only two years before Joseph Cox moved it to the Flat Rock River due to low water supply of the creek. A ford was a shallow place where rivers or streams could be crossed on foot, on horseback, or by vehicle. Because of the cost and difficulty of constructing bridges, Fords were commonplace all over the United States, and Bartholomew County had several of these in the 19th century. One of Bartholomew County's most well-known Fords was located on Clifty Creek east of Columbus. It was often called Fatal Ford because it was considered dangerous to cross here even when the water level was low. Hawk Creek could also be forded or crossed at this shallow spot near the first Cox cabin. For that reason, the road here was eventually named Rocky Ford Road. Prior to construction of a bridge in 1968, travelers on Rocky Ford Road had to drive into and across the creek bed to cross Hall Creek. 
Some residents would even bring their cars here to wash them in the mid-20th century, which could cause significant trouble for other traffic in the area. The graves of Joseph and Mary Cox lie along the west side of Middle Road, just north of Rocky Ford Road. All of the property from the area where the Cox cabin was located to the gravesite, a distance of about one mile, was owned by the Cox family. There were originally four markers with a headstone and a footstone for each grave, but today only three remain. Near the grave sites is one of the oldest homes in the area. Joshua Sims was another early settler who arrived in the future Bartholomew County in 1820, just a year after Joseph Cox. In 1836, Sims purchased a parcel of land from the Cox family and built a home. Over more than 180 years, the property passed through a variety of owners. The home was enlarged and remodeled, but still stands proudly in its original location on Rocky Ford Road. While the native peoples traveled mostly by foot, Settlers arrived on horseback and by wagon as primitive roads were cut through the forests. Because the soil was soft and full of clay and roads were littered with tree stumps, most wagon roads were passable only a few months of each year. In 1820, the Indiana State Legislature provided for several so-called permanent roads to aid in the settlement and the development of the state. These routes would later become known as state roads. The roads were surveyed immediately, but it took several years before any were completed. The first state road to pass through Bartholomew County was the Mox Ferry Road, which ran from the Ohio River through Corridon and Brownstown, and then followed the Driftwood River part of the way to Indianapolis. The Mox Ferry Road was surveyed by John Tipton and completed in 1824. It followed an old Indian trail two miles west of Columbus and did not run through the town. It was speculation that Tipton intentionally bypassed the county seat because of his displeasure that the name had changed from Deptona to Columbus. A second state road called the Madison Road was completed in 1825 and traveled from Madison to Indianapolis through Bartholomew County. The Madison Road between Madison and Columbus later became State Road 7. Bartholomew County benefited from having three major rivers and three major creeks to provide cheap water power and the water routes for transportation. In pioneer times, local farmers and merchants would bring their extra crops or merchandise to the banks of the river in wagons and load them onto flatboats. Within the county, the Driftwood River was known for its shallow depths and for the dangerous floating logs and debris that gave the river its name. For those reasons, flatboats traveled carefully and tied up at night to avoid disaster. After the East Fork of the White River passed through neighboring Jackson County, the depth increased and boats could float safely day and night. Most of these boats were carrying goods to the Wabash River, the Ohio River, and eventually to the Mississippi River. Boatmen would sometimes take their goods all the way to New Orleans to sell them for cash. Then the boats would be sold for lumber and the boatmen would walk back to Columbus. This round trip took about two to three months. The first meeting of the Bartholomew County Commissioners occurred on February 15, 1821 at the cabin of Luke Bonesteel on the banks of the East Fork of the White River at what would eventually be the west end of First Street. The location of the county seat was chosen to be at the confluence of the rivers, which was also the center of the new county. The town was surveyed into lots with four main streets. The lots were 75 feet by 150 feet. The first public sale of land within Columbus occurred in June of 1821. The lots did not have a fixed price but were sold at auction for an average of $51.55, which was more than the cost of 40 acres of land in the rest of the county. The most expensive lot within town sold for $211 from the north corner of what today is 2nd and Jackson Streets across from the courthouse square. The cheapest lots were at the southwest edge of town near the river and sold for just $11 each. This original plat map from Columbus shows how small the original town boundaries were. The river formed the west edge of town, and the further streets to the east was Mechanic Street, known today as Lafayette. The east-west streets all had names such as Walnut Street or Tipton Street. Not until the 1870s would these become numbered streets. The open square visible in the center of the map was reserved for the county courthouse. Luke Bonesteel provided his cabin on the banks of the river to be used as the first courthouse. Not until 1829 was the courthouse erected on Courthouse Square, 
which was on land originally owned by Tipton. It was a relatively small brick structure that was used until 1839. The Third County Courthouse, the second on the courthouse square, was another two-story brick building with a cupola and a bell. It served the purposes of the county government from 1839 to 1874. By 1870, the county began planning for a larger, more permanent courthouse structure. Designed by Isaac Hodgson, construction of the second Empire-style building took place from 1871 to 1874. The foundation stone, finishing stones, and bricks were sourced from central Indiana. Final cost was around $250,000, including $5,000 to purchase the tower clock and bell from the Howard Clock Company in Boston. Here, the courthouse is closer to completion, but still missing its windows and the distinctive tower clock. The building to the left behind the courthouse to the south is the county jail, which was built around the same time in the same style. In December 1874, the fourth county courthouse opened with great fanfare and a celebration marked by music, speeches, and dancing, and covered by newspapers outside of the state. The courthouse clock was installed a few months later in 1875, and the 154-foot clock tower. The original 6-inch thick 10-ton bell still sits in the tower and rings every hour. The clock continued to run with its original weighted mechanisms until 1940 when a cable snap and the smaller of the two weights, which weighed about 500 pounds, crashed through its wooden supports within the tower. This was considered somewhat lucky because officials believe that if the larger 1,200-pound weight had fallen, it likely would have crashed all the way through to the basement. The original clock mechanism still powers the clock today, but it has been electrified since 1940. The exterior of the building is largely unchanged, except a remodeling in 1953 removed all chimneys and all but one dormer and replaced the original slate roof with a seamed copper one. Interior renovations over the years have modernized the same building, including adding an elevator for easier access to all four floors. At the same time, much of the original interior of the courthouse has been preserved, including the curving staircase, Superior Court 1, many of the heavy interior doors, and the decorative ceiling ornamentation on the first floor. The courthouse archives room on the first floor includes one of the building's original fireplaces and the bell from the previous courthouse. For almost a century, the courthouse square remained largely unchanged as well, with the 1870s jail standing just south of the courthouse. However, in 1962, this jail was demolished and a new law enforcement building was built on the southwest corner of the square. The new building housed the jail and the police and sheriff's departments. Today's Bartholomew County Jail was constructed in 1990 about a block away from the courthouse on property east of City Hall on 2nd Street and replaced the functions of the law enforcement building. Today, 25 limestone pillars stand on the lawn behind the courthouse as part of the Bartholomew County Memorial to Veterans, which was installed in 1997. Letters from the Bartholomew County soldiers sent back home in the midst of war are inscribed on the pillars and capture poignant moments in time about difficult moments in our history. After over 140 years, county government businesses continue to be conducted inside the Bartholomew County Courthouse, which remains one of the most recognizable buildings in the area. It has been on the National Register of Historic Places since 1979. In addition to the small size of the town and the open courthouse square, another remarkable aspect of the earliest map of Columbus is the absence of bridges to cross the river at that time. For many years, the only way to cross was by boat. John Lindsay, a nephew of John Tipton, was granted a license to operate the first ferry just downstream from the confluence of the Driftwood and Flat Rock Rivers. Lindsay paid $5 to operate his ferry and could charge six and a quarter cents for man, woman, child, or horse. A four-wheel wagon was 50 cents. It wasn't until 1847 that the first wooden bridge was built to cross the river. Travelers had to pay to cross the bridge until 1859. In 1884, this iron wagon bridge over East Fork of White River replaced the old wooden structure. It was known as the Wagon Bridge or the Second Street Bridge. The iron bridge was raised in 1950 for the construction of yet another new bridge which crossed the river at the same location as the previous bridge but originated from Third Street 
and so was called the Third Street Bridge. The 1950 bridge still stands. It originally carried traffic both in and out of town, but today traffic moves one way and the bridge exclusively carries traffic moving west out of town. Traffic into town crosses another bridge, which was built in 1999. The Second Street Bridge is also known as the Robert N. Stewart Bridge, named after the three-term Columbus mayor who served from 1984 to 1996. Today, when travelers enter Columbus from the west side, the Bartholomew County Courthouse is framed within the structure of the suspension bridge. When John Titpin wrote about the good land, good water, and good timber of the area over 200 years ago, it would have been difficult for him to imagine that the county would one day have around 80,000 inhabitants within its borders. The early contributions of settlers such as Joseph and Mary Cox, Luke Bonesteel, John Lindsay, and so many others laid the foundation that has enabled Bartholomew County to grow into one of the most successful counties in Indiana. After Bartholomew County's founding in 1821, the population of Columbus grew slowly in the early years due to a combination of factors, including the lack of good roads and the difficulty traveling and transporting goods within Indiana. In 1821, 369 taxpayers were listed on the county books. The first census results for the town showed just over 1,000 residents in 1850. Twenty years later, the city population was up to 3,300, and by 1900, over 8,000 people lived within Columbus. Although there were numerous mills scattered around the county, Columbus did not have its own flour mill within the town until 1835. Prior to that, all flour had to be brought in by wagon loads from elsewhere. In 1837, Columbus was incorporated as a town, but records show that only 35 citizens showed up to vote for incorporation. In 1844, the railroad arrived in Columbus, and dramatic change and rapid growth soon followed. The first cargo train arrived from Madison, Indiana, in July of 1844, after almost eight years of construction. It would take three more years for the railroad to reach Indianapolis. Train travel brought increased ability to transport raw materials, goods, and eventually passengers, and led to the demise of transportation by freight wagon, flatboat, or stagecoach. In 1852, the Jeffersonville to Columbus Railroad was completed, bringing a second line through town. The Columbus and Shelbyville line opened in 1853. The location of the first freight depot in Columbus was near the area that is today Mill Race Park. The park is named for a man-made channel of water called a Mill Race that was cut between 12th Street and 2nd Streets. River water was funneled into a narrow ditch so the water could be controlled and would run fast enough to power the mills and factories which were built near the channel. These were present in many parts of the county where mills were located near waterways. The mill race in Columbus was present until 1888. After the arrival of the railroad, industry grew rapidly. Within a few years, numerous mills had sprung up within the city, including sawmills turning trees into lumber, grist mills grinding wheat into flour, and woolen mills spinning fiber into yarn. The area near the river and the mill race was the center of early industry in the area. A plaque located at the entrance of the park commemorates the location of mill race and 10 early companies located in this area. The bricks in the monument wall were taken from a building located in the area in the 19th and early 20th century. The illustrated bird's eye view map from 1886 shows three of the factories present at that time. Mooney's Tannery, Cereal Line, and the Crump Brickworks. Mooney's Tannery was founded in the northwest corner of the county in Nineveh Township in 1837. Tanneries turned animal hides into leather products necessary in pioneer life, including saddles, harnesses, boots, and shoes. During the Civil War in 1863, Mooney's was moved to the site between the railroad and the river in Columbus. The new location provided easy transportation of leather being supplied to the Union Army. In 1900, Mooney's was thought to be the largest tannery in the world, and the company operated until 1962. The building was torn down the next year, but a large concrete wall which protected the tannery from flooding is still standing at the edge of Mill Race Park. 
In the background of this photo, another 19th century building is visible, the Serial Line Building. In 1880s, the Serial Line Building on Jackson Street operated next to the railroad station. The company produced a dry breakfast cereal that was never a commercial success, unlike that of Kellogg's Company in Michigan, but was served on the Titanic and other luxury cruise ships in the early 20th century. This product was also used in the malt, liquor, and beer fermenting process. The building was abandoned in 1892, and the Cereal Line Company moved to Indianapolis to become part of the American Hominy Company. The back portion of the building was later torn down, as was the railroad building, but the taller portion remained standing and was repurposed almost 100 years later. When Cummins, Inc. built its new corporate offices in Columbus in 1983, architects incorporated the Cereal Line building into the design to be used as the employee cafeteria. The third factory visible in this 1886 illustrated map was the Crump Brickyard, seen near the top of the map on the east bank of the Flat Rock River near the Covered Bridge. Francis J. Crump was one of the earliest settlers in Bartholomew County, arriving in 1822 after completing an apprenticeship in carpentry and cabinet making. He made money initially by selling coffins during a malaria outbreak and then found great success buying and selling real estate. In the 1870s, F.J.'s son, F.T. Crump, founded a brickyard, and by 1874, he was considered the wealthiest man in the county for his various business interests. F.J.'s son, John S. Crump, was a Civil War veteran who made his own mark on the county. In 1889, John opened the Crump Theater on 3rd Street, which is still standing. John Crump also opened a hotel called the Belvedere across the street from his theater, and he created the first streetcar system within Columbus. Furthermore, he's credited with building a power plant that made electricity available to city residences for the first time. It's believed that his house, still standing at 704 Lafayette Street, was the first electrified house in the county. While much local industry was concentrated near the rivers and mill race, there was a darker side to the area as well in the early 20th century. Between the tannery and the river, some of the poorer residents of Columbus lived in small shacks and shanties, this area between the railroad tracks and the river was infamously known as Death Valley. The homes were located on low land near the noise and dirt of the railroad tracks. The water of the East Fork of White River often was contaminated with trash and debris from nearby factories, and Death Valley flooded frequently, allowing disease to spread easily. In 1962, Mooney's Tannery was the last of the early industrial buildings near the river to close. After the building was demolished in 1963, the land was purchased by the city of Columbus. A group of citizens known as the River Rats raised money to clean up the area and develop Millrace Park. The park was redesigned in the early 1990s by landscape designer Michael Van Valkenburg to include two lakes and a landscape plan to accommodate for regular flooding. Columbus relied on the rivers near downtown for more than industry. One of the greatest needs for the growing city in the late 19th century was water. At that time, many people took their water straight from the river, which often led to illness. In 1903, in order to provide for fire protection and cleaner water, the city waterworks was built on the banks of the river as the city's power plant and water station. It harnessed water power from the Lowhead Dam over the White River that was constructed around this time and included a gravel water filter to clean the water. The building was built to last with a stone foundation that was 2 feet thick and 17 inch thick interior walls. In 1913, a more modern sand filter was built, which filtered up to 4 million gallons of water each day for the city. The pump house provided water for Columbus until the 1950s when it was replaced by a series of wells. The building has been used by a variety of businesses since then, including serving as the senior center for over 30 years and a restaurant today. Eventually, Columbus grew away from the river. When the first passenger trains arrived in Columbus, they stopped at a railroad station in the middle of the city known as Railroad Square, which was located where today's First Christian Church stands. This 1886 map shows the tracks crossing Washington Street and an angle at 5th Street, with a station located near the corner of Franklin and 4th Streets. For various reasons, the Pennsylvania Railroad eventually abandoned this site and pulled up the tracks in 1892. They moved their lines and station to the west side of town, where the freight station near Mooney's Tannery was located. 
The illustrated 1886 bird's eye view map also includes a list of nine churches present in Columbus at that time. Seven church buildings are visible on the map itself, three of which are still standing today. First United Methodist and First Presbyterian continue to worship in the same building shown on the map. A third remaining structure is a small church located on 8th Street, which has housed many denominations over the years and today is home to God's House Missionary Baptist. The Christian and Baptist churches shown here were demolished in the mid-20th century when their congregations moved into new modernist buildings. The Lutheran and Catholic church buildings are also no longer standing, although they survived into the 21st century. All four congregations are still active. Included on the list of 1886 churches are the African Methodist and African Baptist churches, both of which are listed without addresses because neither congregation had a permanent building at the time. This 1879 clipping from the Columbus Evening Republican encouraged all the black citizens of Columbus to gather together for worship, as no church for the population had been started. According to the article, there were 28 black adults and 10 children in the city at that time. That same year, an African Baptist congregation formed and began meeting in members' homes. By 1913, Second Baptist Church had moved into a frame building at the corner of Ninth and Reed. Today, Second Baptist Church members still worship in the historic building, and it is the city's oldest traditionally black church after more than 140 years. Just a few years after the 1886 bird's eye view map, the first photo was taken from the top of the courthouse tower. This colorized view of the photo is circa 1890 and shows Railroad Square still present on the right. There are only a few recognizable buildings that are still standing, including First Presbyterian Church, which was completed in 1885. Two historic homes are visible as well. The first is the white building in the middle of the view, which was the John Story home, and which today houses the Columbus Area Visitor Center. The second is the red brick structure just at the right edge of the picture, which was the home of influential businessman Joseph Irwin. This same view from the courthouse taken about 20 years later looks much different as Old City Hall on 5th Street and Irwin's Bank on 301 Washington Street are now present. Also, there is now a park where Railroad Square previously stood, known as Commercial Park. It was the first park in Columbus when it was dedicated in 1910. The park became a place for gatherings, rallies, and concerts due in part to its proximity to City Hall. The area along 5th Street in downtown Columbus has remained a cultural corridor for over a century and has played an important role in Columbus history. The John Story home on 5th and Franklin Streets was built in 1864 across from Railroad Square. Over the years, it housed fraternal organizations, a furniture store, and the Boys Club. The photo depicts the building in the 1940s. Since the 1970s, the Story home has housed the Columbus Area Visitor Center. A major expansion enlarged the building in the 1990s, and a large Chihuly glass chandelier hangs in the atrium. Just one block east of the Story home is another local landmark whose 19th century resident played a prominent role in local history. Joseph Ireland Irwin, the patriarch of the Irwin family, and his wife, Harriet Clementine Glanton Irwin, built a stately brick mansion on 5th Street diagonal from Railroad Square, also in 1864. Although the home is still standing, the exterior appearance has changed dramatically since construction. First, it was renovated in the 1880s to add a three-story tower at the entrance on 5th Street. In the 1910s, another major renovation doubled the size of the home. At that time, a sunken garden was also added, modeled after gardens in Italy. Joseph Ireland Irwin was born in Indiana and came to Columbus in 1846 to make his fortune. He began his career in a dry goods store and soon had the money to buy the store. Irwin kept a safe in his store that was the largest in town, prompting others to bring their money to the store for safekeeping. In 1870, Irwin opened his own bank. In 1881, the bank moved to the building at 301 Washington Street. From this building, Irwin ran a growing business empire, which included toll roads, the first local telephone in 1878, the electric streetcar system called the Interurban, and more. Irwin's bank grew and in 1928 merged with another local bank called Union Trust to become known as Irwin Union Bank. 
In the 1950s, the bank moved into a modernist building at 5th and Washington Streets, and it survived until 2009. Joseph Irwin had two children, W.G. Irwin and Lenny Irwin. His children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, along with their spouses, would make their own marks on local history. The extended family became known as the Irwin Sweeney Miller family. As several generations of the Irwin Sweeney Miller family worked together, many lived in the historic Irwin home, which remained in the family until 2009 when it was purchased and transformed into a bed and breakfast. Old City Hall was located on 5th Street. It was built in 1895 across the street from Railroad Square and diagonal from the Story Home. The building was designed by local architect Charles Sparrow, who was responsible for many of Columbus's important buildings around the turn of the 20th century, including homes, churches, commercial and public buildings. Several of Sparrow's buildings survive. In addition to housing offices of the mayor and other city officials, Old City Hall was used for many other purposes. Initially, a farmer's market was located in the basement, and a large auditorium on the second floor was utilized for music programs and basketball games. One of the most famous figures to play basketball on the floor in City Hall was a Zillion native and Columbus High School graduate, Chuck Taylor. He would later go on to fame as a shoe salesman and designer, his namesake, Chuck Taylor All-Stars, are still a best-selling shoe. In 1981, Columbus moved its city hall to a new modern building on 2nd Street designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill Architects. Old City Hall later became a bed and breakfast and now houses a law firm with condominiums on the upper floors. Thanks to the efforts of several women's literary clubs, a two-room library opened in 1899 in City Hall and was an immediate success. Due to its popularity, local citizens realized quickly they needed a larger library and appealed to Andrew Carnegie, philanthropist and benefactor of libraries across the country. Carnegie donated $15,000 and the Columbus Public Library was dedicated in 1903 at the corner of 5th and what is today Lafayette. The building was designed to look like a book standing open with the door in the spine of the book. In 1922, City Council and County Commissioners agreed that the library should be opened up to all residents of the county, and the library was renamed the Columbus Bartholomew County Public Library. By the 1950s, the community began discussing the need for a bigger, better building. Head librarian Cleo Rogers became a tireless advocate for a new space, and renowned architect I.M. Pei was chosen to design it. Rogers died in 1964, and the library board decided to dedicate the new county library to her memory. In 1969, the Cleo Rogers Memorial Library opened just behind the old library, which was soon demolished. I.M. Pei believed the library should be the cultural center of the city. To achieve this, the stretch of Lafayette Streets between 5th and 6th Streets was permanently closed, and a large brick plaza was constructed where the previous library had stood. Local philanthropists J. Irwin and Xenia Miller donated the Henry Moore sculpture Large Arts to anchor the space. Over more than 50 years, concerts and community gatherings have been held here. Through the main library, as well as the Hope Branch, the Bookmobile, and the community outreach, the library has grown and adapted to the county's ever-changing needs for over 100 years to become the community's crossroads for lifelong learning. Behind the original Carnegie Library sat the Tabernacle, officially named the Tabernacle Christian Church, it was built on what was then Mechanic Street in 1878. The pastor of the church at that time was Reverend Z. T. Sweeney, who married Linny Irwin, daughter of Joseph Irwin, whose home was across the street. Several generations of the Irwin Sweeney Miller family were prominent members of the tabernacle. In the late 1930s, the congregation of the church determined that a larger building was needed. Church member J. Irwin Miller, great grandson of Joseph Irwin and grandson of former pastor Z. T. Sweeney, guided the choice of Finnish architect Elias Saarinen to design a new modernist structure across 5th Street. At the time, a modern church building was a radical choice, and the citizens of Columbus were not sure about the non-traditional structure that was rising on the former railroad square and commercial park. The church opened in 1942 and was known as Tabernacle Church of Christ until 1943, when it became Christian Church. In 1957, the name changed again to First Christian Church. 
Today, First Christian Church is one of the most recognizable buildings in the city. For many years at the corner of 5th and Washington Street sat a triangular building which for many years served as the offices of the Columbus Republican. Its triangular shape and facade that was set back from the corner was a result of the train that once crossed Washington to the old railroad square. The newspaper was founded by Isaac T. Brown and began as a weekly paper in 1872. It transitioned to a daily edition in 1877. The cost to receive six days a week newspaper service at that time was $5 for one year. Although the name changed several times, it was known for the longest period as the Evening Republican. In 1967, the paper became the Republic. The newspaper continued to be run by six successive generations of the Brown family until it was sold in 2015. While the Republican was the longest lasting newspaper and the Republic continues to serve as the paper of record for Bartholomew County, There were many other competitors in the early days, including the Columbus Chronicle, which was founded in 1831. Other newspapers over the years included Columbus Gazette, Columbus Weekly News, Columbus Bulletin, the Bartholomew Democrat, the Columbus Herald, the Daily Evening Democrat, and many more. While there are a few remaining copies of some of these papers, many survive in historical and online collections, providing historians and interested readers with a wealth of historic information. Near the east end of 5th Street on Pearl Street between 6th and 7th sat Columbus's first public school, called Old Central, which opened in 1859. Between the county's founding in 1821 and that time, the education of local children was addressed by a variety of private schools, including many one-room schoolhouses throughout the county. While free public education was written into the constitutions of the Northwest Territory and the state of Indiana, no funding was provided, so local schools were supported by donations and pupil fees. Old Central originally housed students of all ages, from elementary through high school. Like most schools in the county and country, both the building itself and the playground were segregated for black and white students. In this 1899 photo, teacher Charles Jackson leads a classroom of 4th to 7th graders. The following year, Granville Lee would become the first black graduate of Columbus High School in 1901. His sister, Mabel, graduated four years later. Beginning in 1871, a variety of new public schools were being built around Columbus as the population was growing. Several of these buildings are still standing today, including the first Ward School, McKinley, and Maple Grove or Garfield, which is the BCSC administrative headquarters today. Old Central was eventually torn down, and in 1905, Columbus High School opened on 7th Street between Pearl and Sycamore. It was also called Central School, Like the other building, it had replaced and initially housed only high school students. This building would serve Columbus students for over 100 years, first as Columbus High School, then Central Junior High, and finally Central Middle School. The 1905 building was torn down in 2007 and replaced with yet another school in the same general location called Central Middle School. This is the third Central School to be located here includes several remnants of the earlier schools, including a fountain, lamppost, and several stone inscriptions that were incorporated into the new building. This inscription, To Our Children, can be found in a prominent location inside the new central and was once located over the door of the 1859 building. Also in 1905, the city's black population had grown enough to qualify for a separate school for younger children. At this time, there were only five black high school students, and they remained at Columbus High School. Some citizens felt it unfair that black residents had helped pay for the new Central School building with their tax money, but black children were not allowed to attend Central. Nonetheless, the Booker T. Washington School opened in a small frame building that had been moved from the grounds of the high school to a new location at 14th and Union Streets. The school served grades 1 to 7 until it was closed in 1922 due to declining enrollment. From that point forward, schools in and around Columbus were integrated. Nothing remains of the Booker T. Washington building and no photos are known to exist, but an historic marker reminds passers-by of this important piece of local history. 
High school students in Columbus remained downtown in the 1905 building until the 1950s when construction began on a new high school complex on 25th Street on the north side of town. After a public fundraising campaign raised several hundred thousand dollars in just two weeks, Memorial Gymnasium opened in 1954, two years before the high school itself welcomed students. In 1972, a second high school called Columbus East opened across town after the number of Columbus High School students had grown to over 900 in each class. The former Columbus High School became Columbus North High School. In 1965, the Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation was formed to organize schooling for 10 of the 12 county townships. Flat Rock and Hall Creek townships had previously formed their own school corporation. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the community embarked on an ambitious program of school construction to meet the needs of the growing community. Today, BCSC includes one dedicated pre-kindergarten center, 11 elementary schools, two middle schools, three high schools, and an adult education center to educate students of all ages within the Bartholomew Consolidated School District. School children and adults alike have enjoyed many popular city parks over the years, including two near the library that were eventually replaced with buildings. Commercial Park, which from 1910 to 1941 was located where First Christian Church now stands, and Irwin Park, which from 1947 to 1968 was located on the now closed sections of Lafayette, where the library is today. Another park north of 17th Street between Lafayette and Chestnut has welcomed visitors for over 100 years. Donner Park, formerly known as Perry's Woods. Born in Bartholomew County, John A. Perry, grandson of early settler Ransom Perry, was engaged in farming and owned many acres of land, including Perry's Woods. This area was north of the city limits prior to 1900 and next to City Cemetery. Perry leased the land to the city, and it was a popular recreation destination in the 1880s and later. In 1915, Perry's Park was considered as a possible location for a new county hospital. Mary Donner, who lived nearby, asked her son, wealthy industrialist William Donner, to purchase the park and donate it to the city to preserve the open space. Will Donner did this and asked that the park be named Donner Park after his mother. In 1947, Donner donated the swimming pool and community center to the park as well. Over 70 years later, Donner Pool is still a popular place for families to enjoy in the summer, and the playground and shelter houses are used much of the year. Donner is now one of 23 parks with over 1,000 acres of parkland managed by Columbus Parks and Recreation Department. Over 360,000 participants annually enjoy Columbus Parks and park programs each year. With Perry's Woods no longer an option, the county chose another area on 17th Street, east of the city limits, to build a county hospital. Bartholomew County Hospital opened in 1917 and was the first hospital in Indiana to be built after a 1913 state law allowed communities to issue bonds to pay for local hospitals. To enable people to get to the new facility, 17th Street was extended and a new bridge built over Hawk Creek. In the 1940s, Will Donner made another major contribution to his hometown through a large donation to the hospital to provide a clinical laboratory, x-ray equipment, and salaries for the first pathologists and radiologists. In 1992, a major renovation and addition took place, and the hospital's name changed to Columbus Regional Hospital to reflect its service to patients outside of the county. In June 2008, the hospital was affected by an historic flood that devastated much of Columbus. An estimated 15% of all structures in Columbus were damaged. After unusually heavy rains fell on saturated soil, Hall Creek rose quickly and water inundated the hospital, flooding the basement and part of the first floor. The hospital was closed for four months. To prevent similar disasters in the future, the hospital installed a gated flood wall and an improved flood warning system. Today, the facility is part of Columbus Regional Health, a modern health system caring for patients in 10 counties. Shortly after the founding of Donner Park and the opening of the county hospital, two companies which would have long-lasting impact on Columbus were founded in the same year, 1919. Bartholomew County native Q.G. Noblet, along with Frank Sparks and another partner, founded the company that would eventually become Arvin Industries in Indianapolis. Known initially as the Indianapolis Air Pump Company, 
the company produced much-needed brass tire pumps for the new automobiles that were starting to fill American roads. Some production began on some of the first automobile heaters as well, thanks to a partnership with Richard Arvin, who held the patents, and eventually the company became known as Noblet Sparks and moved to Columbus in 1931. Noblet Sparks was the largest employer in the Columbus area during the Great Depression, and the company expanded into a variety of automotive and household items. In 1950, Noblet Sparks became Arvin Industries. Arvin produced mufflers, exhaust pipes, and catalytic converters for cars and trucks, along with radios, televisions, and home heaters. The company also manufactured indoor and outdoor living items, such as tables, chairs, and grills. In 1969, Arvin had 8,000 worldwide employees and in 1987 reached $1 billion in sales. After a merger in the year 2000 formed Arvin Meritor, its influence locally declined. In 2011, Meritor divested the last of the former Arvin interest and dropped Arvin from the company name. French firm Forcia ultimately purchased the exhaust business and manufacturing plants and still produces many products in Bartholomew County. Unlike Arvin, Cummins, Inc., founded in 1919 by Classy Cummins and W.G. Irwin, is still a major manufacturing influence in Bartholomew County. W.G. Irwin was a businessman, investor, and son of Irwin's bank founder, Joseph Irwin. Classy was an inventor and the Irwin family's mechanic and chauffeur. While working for Irwin, Classy operated an automobile repair business and opened the Cummins Machine Works. In 1919, with Urban's financial backing, Cummins Engine Company was incorporated. The men worked together for 19 years before turning their diesel engine enterprise into a profitable business. Throughout the mid to late 20th century, the company continued to grow. In 1956, Cummins opened its first international factory, and in 2005, international sales outpaced national sales for the first time. Today, there are many Cummins facilities in Indiana including several within Columbus. Plant One is located in the south end of Central Avenue as one of the company's large manufacturing facilities. The Cummins Tech Center is on the east side of Central on Hall Creek. It opened in 1967 to focus on research and innovation. Today, Cummins Inc. is an international Fortune 200 company producing engines, filtration, and power generation products. Cummins is the largest employer in Bartholomew County and one of the largest employers in the state of Indiana. The company's corporate headquarters remains in Columbus and is located on Jackson Street at the site of the 19th century cereal line mill. As Cummins grew throughout the 20th century under the leadership of W.G. Irwin's great nephew, J. Irwin Miller, the company started one of the first corporate foundations in the nation in 1954. Miller believed that Columbus should be the very best community of its size in the country. In part to achieve these goals, the organizations made its first grant in 1957 to support architecture fees for Ludlian C. Schmidt Elementary, which was designed by renowned architect Harry Weiss. The Columbus Architecture Program became a formal part of the Cummins Foundation in 1960, recommending architects and supporting the design fees of certain public buildings. To date, more than 50 building projects in the Columbus area have been sponsored by the Cummins Foundation, which has placed Columbus in the forefront of modernist architecture. As a result of the Foundation's architecture program, Columbus has become an internationally known attraction for those interested in modernist architecture. Besides attracting over 10,000 visitors per year, the city has attracted national awards and accolades. In 1991, the American Institute of Architects ranked Columbus sixth in the nation for architectural innovation and design behind the much larger cities of Chicago, New York, Boston, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. Columbus is also home to seven National Historic Landmarks, a rare feat for a city of its size. Although the mid-20th century was a time of positive growth and change in local industry and architecture, Columbus struggled during this time with many of the same civil rights challenges occurring across the United States. The climate in Columbus was often not welcoming to African-American families. Black men had to leave town to get a haircut because no barbers would cut their hair. Most neighborhoods were segregated, and residents of white neighborhoods sometimes tried to keep black residents out. In 1962, a group of men, including Benjamin Mickey King, a respected black microbiologist, businessman Owen Hungerford, and the Reverend William Laws, and attorney and future Congressman Lee Hamilton, 
founded the Commission on Human Relations with one of its first goals to create a fair housing ordinance for Columbus. In 1964, J. Irwin Miller, who was then chairman of Cummins, made clear his personal belief and the position of Cummins Engine Company that it was critical to create a community that is open in every single respect to persons of every race, color, and opinion. This was a very radical idea for a corporation at the time and a powerful statement that propelled change in Columbus. Today, the Human Rights Commission is part of city government and works to provide equal opportunity for all and to prevent discrimination in employment, housing, education, and public accommodations. Its mission includes educating the public about the issues of human rights and challenging attitudes that create barriers to equality. In addition, many local organizations such as Heritage Fund, the Community Foundation of Bartholomew County, Sukasa, and the African American Fund continue to make the efforts of making Columbus and Bartholomew County a welcoming community. While so much progress has been made, much work still needs to be done to achieve Mr. Miller's vision. The development of Columbus in the second half of the 20th century was aided by many factors, including the growth of the population and the influx of new businesses. In 1949, the size of the city of Columbus grew when East Columbus was officially annexed and became part of Columbus after several years of contentious debates and a legal battle that went all the way to the Indiana Supreme Court. The process began on May 20th, 1946, when the Columbus City Council altered its agenda at the last minute to place the annexation ordinance on the table. At the same meeting, the council voted to suspend the rules and allow passage on the first reading of the motion rather than the normal two. East Columbus residents were angered with this decision, claiming their voices were not allowed to be heard. Despite petitions against it, the courts eventually ruled the annexation was legal. Despite this contentious merger, East Columbus has played a large role in the city's development. Mabel McDowell Elementary was built in 1960 as the second school built with design funds from the Cummins Foundation. It is now an adult education center and is one of the city's seven national historic landmarks. Fadria Elementary School is an open concept school that was one of the first schools in the county designed to also function as a community center. Fadria is now part of the Columbus Signature Academy pathway through the Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation. Another notable feature of East Columbus is Costco, now part of the Durrell Juvenile Company. The Columbus Specialty Company was founded in 1935 by B.F. Hamilton, a former executive of Noblet Sparks, and his three sons. The company started manufacturing matchboxes in a single room in a downtown building, but grew into making housewares and home furnishing accessories. By 1940, the company was making over 600,000 match containers and 400,000 dustpans a year. Due to growth and demand, the company moved to a large new facility on State Street in 1949. Over the years, the company has gone through many name changes from Hamilton Manufacturing to Hamilton Costco and then Costco in 1974. In 1988, Durrell acquired Costco. The manufacturing plant remains an East Columbus landmark making car seats, bicycles, and other home products. B.F. Hamilton was also influential as a community member and philanthropist, gifting an ice rink which now bears his name, Hamilton Center. Starting in the 1960s, Columbus City limits began a large expansion to the west as well. First, the area of State Road 46 between downtown and the Interstate 65 interchange was developed and also annexed, which brought economic gain and more residential development on the city's west side. Woodside Industrial Park is a large area off I-65 south of Columbus at the Walesboro exit. The area first opened as Woodside Business Center in 1979 after major investments by local companies who hoped to attract new businesses to the area. Since then, a large number of international companies, including many automotive suppliers, have opened in the Woodside area, which is now within city limits. Changes were happening closer to downtown as well. In the 1960s and early 70s, like many other cities, Columbus was struggling with how to react to the movement away from the downtown center. Housing, shopping, and other businesses were beginning to relocate and abandon the once vibrant downtown. A 1968 master plan was developed with an ambitious idea to reinvigorate the area by, among other things, clearing and rebuilding an entire 53-acre area downtown. Among the first buildings to be built were the Republic Newspaper Building on 2nd Street, and the new post office on Jackson Street. 
The centerpiece of this plan was a building to serve as a publicly owned community space and a privately owned retail mall. Designed by Cesar Pelle, the Commons Mall was dedicated in 1974. The public space included an indoor playground, a stage, and the kinetic sculpture Chaos One, designed by Swiss artist Jean Tangle. Chaos was donated by J. Irwin Miller and his wife Xenia and his sister Clementine Tanzeman. Tangle assembled Chaos in the historic Columbus Pump House from 1973 until 1974 using mostly scrap materials, much of which came from metal salvage company Crutes, a local company which has been in business since 1900. The mall, while anchored by Sears, never really achieved the results hoped for. Because of this and maintenance needs, after much community discussion, the decision was made that the building should be demolished and replaced in the early 2000s. During the demolition and construction of the new commons, chaos was protected by a giant steel box that allowed the 30-foot tall, 3-ton sculpture to remain in place as the new building took shape around it. The new commons, which opened in 2011, no longer has the mall component attached. Instead, only the public portion remains with a new playground, event space, and Chaos One. The remaining portions of the lot became office space for Cummins, Inc. Beyond industry, the city has also made efforts to increase post-secondary educational opportunities with three institutions located on the Columbus Municipal Airport campus, which is called the Columbus Air Park. The Columbus campus of Ivy Tech Community College was established in 1967 and moved to its current location at the airport in 1983. Locally, Ivy Tech serves over 3,000 students from four counties, Bartholomew, Decatur, Jackson, and Jennings, and offers hands-on experience with some of the state's most advanced technologies and training facilities, plus the convenience of more than 1,000 online classes and small class sizes. Indiana University, Purdue University Columbus, was founded in 1970. It was originally known as IUPUI Columbus as an extension of IUPUI in Indianapolis. In 1971, all classes were moved to the current location on Central Avenue near the airport. IUPUC offers a variety of undergraduate degrees and master's degree programs in business administration, mental health, counseling, and nursing. Purdue Polytechnic Columbus is currently headquartered in the Advanced Manufacturing Center of Excellence in Columbus. Founded in 1983, Purdue Polytechnic Institute of Columbus is part of a statewide network that offers Bachelor of Science Technology degree programs and leadership certifications. The Columbus Learning Center was completed in 2005 to meet the community's educational and workforce needs. The building connects the Ivy Tech, Purdue Polytechnic, and IUPUC campuses at the Columbus Airport. The Learning Center was developed as part of the Columbus Community Education Coalition's push to increase access to education and economic opportunities. One of the best local educational destinations is the Bartholomew County Historical Society Museum at 524 Third Street. Founded in 1921, the Historical Society thrives to collect, preserve, discover, and share the history of our county. Originally located in the basement of the county courthouse, BCHS moved to its present location in 1973. The museum is located in the McEwen Samuels Mar home, which was constructed around 1860 and was completely renovated when the society acquired it. The exterior appearance remains much as it originally stood and the cast iron fence around the property dates from about 1864. Inside are state-of-the-art permanent exhibits on Bartholomew County history in the early industrial heritage of the area. The museum also hosts rotating and traveling exhibits. Columbus Township is not only the geographical and governmental center of Bartholomew County, it is an economic, entertainment, and commercial center as well. In its bicentennial year, Columbus is a thriving small city of around 48,000 people, including a large international population. Can the next 200 years be even better, as citizens remember the past, but plan for the future? Bartholomew County was founded in 1821, just five years after Indiana statehood in 1816. This early Indiana map shows the state of Indiana around the time Bartholomew County was added. Although Bartholomew County was actually founded first, it has not yet been labeled, while Shelby and Marion County appear on the map. 
At its founding, Bartholomew County's size was significantly larger than it is today, as in this Indiana map circa 1830, because most of the current day Brown County was originally part of Bartholomew County. When Brown County was formed 15 years later in 1836, Bartholomew County became the size that it is today. All of Indiana's 92 counties are divided into smaller sections called townships. In Bartholomew County, the townships were not determined in 1821 when the county was founded but were slowly organized over the next 20 years. By the beginning of 1822, only Sand Creek and Wayne townships in the south of the county had been formally organized. In May of 1824, five more townships were created. These included Clifty, Nineveh, and Columbus townships, along with two townships north of Columbus, Driftwood and Flat Rock. Driftwood Township included the area between the Driftwood and the Flat Rock Rivers, and Flat Rock Township included land east of the river to the county line. Later that same year, Driftwood Township's name was changed to German Township. Additional changes occurred over the following 20 years, and by 1847, Bartholomew County was organized into 14 townships, which would remain in place for almost 100 years. The area of the county north and northwest of Columbus, including Nineveh, Union, German, and Flat Rock Townships, primarily an agricultural region with a unique history. German Township was originally bordered by the Driftwood River on the west and the Flat Rock River on the east. The Driftwood River flows from the northwest corner of the county towards its meeting with the Flat Rock River in Columbus. Two busy mills were found on the Driftwood River in the 19th century. Tannehill Mill west of Taylorsville and Lowell Mill about three and a half miles south. The first mill at the Tannehill site was built in 1822. Zachariah Tannehill bought the land along with the early flour mill and a distillery around 1830. He later converted the distillery into a woolen mill shown in this photo. The flour mill at Tannehill was purchased by David Miller in 1876 and this 1879 map of the area shows this area including the dam upriver, the bridge, and the flour and grist mill, which used a water wheel to turn a stone and grind grain into flour. The current of the river at this location was reportedly strong enough that the mills could run year-round and flatboats left directly from this area to carry goods downstream to the Ohio River and beyond. Also present on the map was a mill race, which was a man-made narrow channel of water dug from a spot upriver to the downriver area to create faster water flow to power a mill. Mill Race Park in Columbus is today named for the mill race that was used in the 19th century to power the mills and factories in early Columbus. In 1900, the Tannehill Mill Race was gone and the mill was owned by SS Drybread. The mill, located just north of the bridge on the east bank of the river, is the flour mill, which is seen in this undated photo taken around the turn of the 20th century. The sign of the building advertises Silver Moon Flour for sale by S.S. Dry Bread, manufactured in Taylorsville, Indiana. The Tannehill Covered Bridge was built around 1870 and was one of the last two covered bridges in Bartholomew County when it was torn down in 1965 and replaced by a modern bridge. Today, little remains of the Tannehill Mill area but the name of a road and a local neighborhood. While some early mills had towns spring up around them, the closest town to the Tannehill Mill was Taylorsville, which is located on U.S. 31 north of Columbus in the center of German Township. Taylorsville is the only town in German Township and was founded in 1849. It was first known as Herod, but the name was changed to Taylorsville in honor of President Zachary Taylor in 1852. Although the town has remained small, it has had a post office since 1849. Having a post office was a mark of significance for small towns, and around 1850, there were 13 towns with post offices in Bartholomew County. Today, there are only six county post offices remaining, including Taylorsville. Since the beginning of the county, the Taylorsville area has been important in transportation of people and goods, first due to its location near the Driftwood River. Later, it was the home of a stagecoach inn and a stop on the railroad between Columbus and Indianapolis. The mid-19th century stagecoach inn building still stands today on Tannehill Road in Taylorsville, and it is used as apartments. When the JM&I Railroad was completed between Columbus and Indianapolis in the 1840s, the tracks went right through the Taylorsville area. Railroads then were often known by the initials of the cities they passed through. 
and the JM&I was named for Jeffersonville, Madison, and Indianapolis. This 1879 map shows Taylorsville with the railroad tracks bisecting the town running north and south. This circa 1910 photo postcard looking east shows the tracks crossing Tannehill Road with the depot on the left. An 1856 train schedule shows the northbound route from Madison to Indianapolis on the left and the southbound stops on the right. Between Columbus and Taylorsville, there was a stop at Lowell, which was also sometimes known as Hornbrook. The Lowell station was called a flag station, meaning the trains only stop if a flag or other signal was displayed or if passengers wanted to get off or on the train. West of the Lowell flag station on the Driftwood River was Lowell Mills, a bustling small town in the mid-19th century. The earliest mill was built at Lowell around 1821 when Bartholomew County was founded. By 1824, the first permanent road to connect the Ohio River to Indianapolis, called the Mox Ferry Road, passed through this area. Between 1830 and 1880, Lowell Mills included two grist mills, a woolen mill, a shoemaker's shop, a distillery, and a sawmill. There was also a cooperage where wooden barrels, casks, and buckets were made. This 1879 map shows both the Lowell Mills area at the left and the Lowell flag station along the railroad on the right. Like the Tannehill Mill, Lowell Mills had a man-made mill race to power the mills. After all of the mills and factories closed around 1880, Lowell Mills was abandoned and most traces of that town disappeared. Like Tannehill, there was an old covered bridge at Lowell that stood until the mid-20th century and was one of the last covered bridges in the county. It was torn down in 1959 and replaced with a new concrete bridge. Today, all that remains of the once thriving area or a historic marker, the road sign for Lowell Road, and piles of stones remaining from the old bridge abutments. Both Bartholomew County's waterways and its location on early railroads and roads meant that transportation was important in the development of the county, but other factors, including agriculture and religion, were also crucial to how and where the county developed. Religion in particular was important to many of the early settlers in Bartholomew County, and the northern areas of the county were homes to several very early church communities. In 1821, just as the county was founded, the Methodist Episcopal Church organized its first Methodist circuit, which was called the Flat Rock Circuit, and which served all of Bartholomew and Jennings County, along with parts of Shelby, Morgan, and Jackson counties. Circuits were areas of land covered by traveling preachers. Because of the number of people and the distance between them, early Methodist preachers were called circuit riders, and traveled on horseback from place to place, preaching in homes sometimes to only three or four congregates at a time. That same year, a Methodist Episcopal church was formed in the Hall Patch, which was the area between the Flat Rock River and Hall Creek. This was the first Methodist church in the county and one of the earliest of any denomination. By 1822, a log church was built called Liberty Meeting at the north edge of what today is Columbus Municipal Airport. The church building was gone before 1879, but Liberty Cemetery survives and includes the graves of many early settlers. Also in 1821, another Methodist congregation was formed at Lowell Station called Carter's Chapel. The church was close to the eventual location of the railroad tracks. Again, as was common, when a church building sometimes disappeared, the cemetery associated with the church often remained. Today, part of the original Carter Cemetery is hidden in plain sight between the north and southbound lanes of US 31, just north of Columbus. Although some of Bartholomew County's earliest churches did not survive, others have thrived for over 200 years now. Around the same time the Methodists were organizing their church communities, at the time of the county's founding, Old Union Church in German Township was founded. Frederick Steinbarger was a member of the denomination known as New Light Christians. Setting aside one room in his log cabin for worship, the Old Union Congregation was formally organized in 1821. A framed church building was erected in 1853, and in 1884 a brick structure was constructed which still stands. The church is located at the intersection of County Roads 50 West and 800 North, and Steinbarger is buried in the cemetery across the road. Closer to Columbus, another early German township church has also survived. The New Hope Christian Church was organized in the 1820s by a group of Baptist worshipers, including a man named Benjamin Irwin, uncle of prominent Columbus citizen Joseph Irwin. 
Around 1855, a group of congregants broke off from the New Hope Church to form a Christian church in downtown Columbus called the Tabernacle Church. The Tabernacle Church later became First Christian Church. However, even as some church members left, the New Hope congregation itself continued to grow, and a brick church building was constructed in 1871. Although the building has had many additions and renovations, it is still recognizable where it stands on Highway 31, adjacent to the railroad tracks just north of the Columbus Township line and near the former Lowell Flag Station. One prominent Bartholomew County family associated with New Hope Christian Church was the Perry Breeding Family. Ransom Perry was born in North Carolina in 1774. He served seven months in the War of 1812 and fought under General Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Perry arrived in Bartholomew County around 1822 with his wife and eight children, just one year after the county was founded. In 1835, Ransom Perry hired Colonel James Glanton, a furniture and cabinet maker, to build a home on North Washington Street. At the time, the house was well outside of the city limits. Today, this is believed to be the oldest home still standing within Columbus Township. Colonel Glanton had three daughters. One of them, seated left in the photo, married Joseph Irwin, the prominent Columbus citizen involved in banking and industry who built the Irwin home on 5th Street. Another of Glanton's daughters, standing in the center, married Ransom Perry's son, James M. Perry. James M. Perry eventually became the largest landowner in Bartholomew County, owning around 6,000 acres of farmland at the time of his death in 1909. Among his land holdings, Perry owned the land surrounding the New Hope Christian Church and the cemetery behind the church where he is buried. In 1890, he built a home on land next to the church for his son and family. James M. Perry's granddaughter, Blanche, was born and raised in the home, which still stands today. In 1916, Blanche married Henry Breeding, whose family also had longtime Bartholomew County ties, and they moved together onto the Breeding Farm in northern German Township. Henry Breeding's grandfather, Elza Breeding, first purchased 160 acres of farmland in 1847 for $240 in German Township near the Shelby County line. A brick home was built on the property in 1860. After this house burned, another home was rebuilt in the same style in 1871. The Breeding family slowly added to their land and by 1879 owned over 600 acres in northern Bartholomew County. Henry bought the farm from his uncle prior to his wedding to Blanche in 1916. The Breeding Farm was an active farm. Henry raised and sold beef cattle and Blanche raised chickens and had an extensive garden. The large barn on the property was built after World War II to replace an earlier wooden structure that had burned. Henry and Blanche lived together in the farmhouse until Blanche died in 1977. Henry then remained on the farm alone another several years until his own death in 1982. The Breedings had no children and willed the farmhouse, outbuildings, and 161 acres to the Bartholomew County Historical Society, which continues to maintain the farm as part of its collection and as an event space for weddings and other gatherings. Just east of the New Hope Church is the historic New Hope, or Tinky Bridge, an iron and concrete two-span frat through truss design extending 256 feet across the Flat Rock River, one mile northwest of Columbus. The bridge is located on County Road 400 North, which connects US 31 and River Road. Built in 1913, the New Hope Bridge was a significant contribution to the development of the city and to agriculture in German Township by connecting US 31 to the rural areas across the river. Evidence suggests that the large steel trusses were fabricated by the Caldwell and Drake Iron Works, a construction and contracting firm located in Columbus at the turn of the 20th century which manufactured steel truss bridges all over southern Indiana. Caldwell & Drake is most famous for the construction of the West Baden Spring Hotel in southern Indiana from 1901 to 1902. The firm was also known around the country for building over 20 buildings at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair and at least 13 domed courthouses in Indiana and five other states. This bridge is the last Caldwell & Drake bridge remaining in Bartholomew County. After almost 80 years of wear and tear from traffic and from weather, the New Hope Bridge was closed in 1990 due to concerns for its safety and structural integrity. It remained closed for several years until the decision was made to restore and repair the bridge rather than replace it. 
Due to the cost of repair, the decision was somewhat controversial at the time. While many argued that the bridge had significant historical value, others believed a one-lane bridge on a narrow country road should instead be replaced with a larger structure that could carry more traffic. The project went forward, however, and the bridge reopened to traffic in 1998. Today, the historic one-lane bridge is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. County roads and bridges were critical to farmers and the development of the agricultural industry. Around the turn of the century, the Reeves family would introduce technology and equipment that would contribute to the further growth of this important segment of the Bartholomew County economy. Ultimately, they would found two companies, Reeves and & Company and the Reeves Pulley Company. They would both create innovations throughout the United States. Reeves & Company was an agricultural implement company that produced equipment that was used by farmers all over the country. Reeves' inventions included a tongueless corn plow, a straw stacker, threshing machinery, steam engines, and more. Reeves plows were famous for their strength and were used to plow virgin prairie in the western United States around the turn of the 20th century. Reeves steam engines were used to pull large farm equipment. While Reeves & Company produced equipment used in farming, the Reeves Pulley Company made an impact on industry, producing wood split pulleys, which were used in many early factories. Wood pulleys were lighter and stronger than cast iron pulleys, which were heavy and prone to shattering. Reeves pulleys ranged in size from a few inches to 22 feet in diameter. At the time, most factories used steam engines to supply power, with the engines turning overhead shafts attached to pulleys and belts connecting the pulleys to necessary factory machinery. Reeves Pulley Company also invested in other new technology at the turn of the 20th century and produced a clutch, variable speed transmissions, gas engines, and early automobiles. The variable speed transmissions were used in sawmills and also in Reeves automobiles. In 1896, Reeves produced what is generally considered to be the fifth American automobile known as a motorcycle. Today, many Reeves items are part of the Bartholomew County Historical Society collection and used for educational events at the Henry Breeding Farm and elsewhere. Although agriculture has been important for much of Bartholomew County since its founding, it was the rich land of Flat Rock Township between the Flat Rock River and Haw Creek that attracted the first white settlers. This area was known as the Haw Patch, as much of it was covered with small haw trees. Travel was difficult because the land was swampy and covered with underbrush. Still, the farmland was fertile and attractive to early settlements by those who came in the county's first years. Although some of Bartholomew County's earliest towns have survived for 150 to 200 years, others like Lowell Mills disappeared from the map. Flat Rock Township also has several so-called ghost towns, including one located on a busy county road. The intersection of River Road and County Road 550 North is at the edge of the Hall Patch and is called Owens Bend for a bend in the Flat Rock River and the name of a family who once lived nearby. Today there's a park there, but once a town called Cormantown was located on this spot. At one time, because of the river, the area was busy with a sawmill, a grain mill, and a woolen factory. A man-made dam provided power for the mills, and several shops supported families who lived nearby. Today, most of the signs of the town are gone, except for a cemetery and a few homes. The cemetery was once part of the Flat Rock Baptist Church, which was one of the earliest church communities in the county, founded in 1821. The church building was torn down around 1920, and a stone marker erected the following year to commemorate its location. On the edge of the former Corman town stands a brick building that used to be a schoolhouse. Built in 1885, this building was used until 1913 to educate the children of the families who lived in Cormantown and the surrounding countryside. In the 19th century, Indiana state government required every township to be responsible for free public education. Since no money was budgeted to the townships, schools generally operated on subscription, meaning families were required to pay for their students' schooling, and sometimes families paid with goods or services instead of cash. In 1879, Flat Rock Township had 10 district schools, meaning some students had to walk several miles to get to a school. This school was known as School Number 8, but it was also called Quick School 
because the land for the school was donated by Judge Tunis Quick, who owned the land and lived just up the road. This was a one-room school, meaning that children in grades 1 through 8 attended the school in the same classroom with one teacher. The teacher could earn $2 a day teaching 14 students in 8 grades with an extra 10 cents a day for cleaning the school. This 19th century map shows the school just down the road from Cormantown and Flat Rock Baptist Church near Tunis Quick's home. The church has been gone for over 100 years and the businesses for over 150 years. Today all that remains is the cemetery and a few houses in the old Quick School, which like many other former schools in Bartholomew County, has been repurposed as a home. The disappearance of small villages and towns on rivers was not uncommon as transportation routes changed over time. Once trains arrived in Indiana, water transportation became much less important and towns that were not near the tracks often struggled to survive. The train first came to Columbus in 1844, but as it expanded toward Indianapolis, the track did not connect to Cormantown. Instead, the first railroad passed to the west at Taylorsville. A few years later, another railroad came through the area but bypassed Cormantown to the east. This time, many of the people and businesses in Cormantown followed the railroad to a new town called Clifford. Some of the buildings themselves were even moved. This map from 1879 shows the railroad going through Clifford and Cormantown is no longer present near the Flat Rock Baptist Church. Clifford was founded in 1853 along the Cambridge City branch of the Jefferson, Madison and Indianapolis Railroad. While the main branch of the line passed through Taylorsville, the Cambridge City branch ran east of the main line. This 1879 map of Flat Rock Township shows this branch coming from Columbus in the south through Clifford and then north through the small town of St. Louis Crossing before entering Shelby County on its way to Cambridge City in eastern Indiana. A more detailed map shows the town of Clifford with the railroad track cutting a diagonal line through town. The railroad tracks are now gone, but some evidence remains that the railroad once went through the area, including the Depot Street sign, the grassy alleyway along Miller Street showing where the tracks once ran, and the angle of the telephone poles that lead south toward Columbus. Telephone and utility poles often ran along railroad tracks for several reasons. First, railroad tracks always took the most direct route between stops. Second, utility companies required easements or the right to build on property belonging to someone else to install their poles and lines. It was much easier for the phone and utility companies to obtain an easement from the owner of a railroad or a road rather than from the numerous landowners along a different route. Today, the routes of telephone or utility poles often indicate abandoned railroad lines. Because of the railroad, Clifford had a depot or railroad station to let passengers on or off and to load or unload cargo. The Clifford Depot still stands behind a tall fence, but it has been repurposed as a residence. Although it's partially hidden, the angle of the home and the large roof overhang are typical of the architecture of depots in the mid-1800s. Other evidence of the railroad that once ran through Clifford are largely gone. The rails from the track have been removed and the ties have all rotted away, even a bump in the road wearing away. Other small parts of Clifford's history are remarkable as well. Even though Clifford was a rather small town, at one point it had its own school, several stores, two churches, and a post office. In 1901, a school was built on the south side of Main Street. This school burned in 1913, and a larger brick school was built on the edge of town to replace it. Clifford High School was the smallest of three high schools in the county in the middle 20th century. Columbus High School, Hope High School, and Clifford High School. When Flat Rock and Hall Creek Townships consolidated their schools in 1957, the Clifford High School students merged with Hope High School to form Hauser. After that, the Clifford School Building served as an elementary school for 16 years before it was torn down in 1973. Today, the site is also known as Alumni Park in honor of those who graduated from Clifford High School. Founded because of the railroad, Clifford has survived long after the railroads left by holding on to pieces of the past. Although the town population is under 300, it is one of only six towns in Bartholomew County with its own post office, a post office which has been present since 1853. The area around Clifford is rich farmland in the Hall Patch, with the Flat Rock River located to the west and Hall Creek to the east. Today, these farms 
fields yield corn, soybeans, wheat, and sometimes other crops. Because the land was originally very swampy, drainage pipes have been laid underground. Agricultural drainage involves laying rows of pipes made of clay, concrete, or perforated plastic under the soil to remove excess moisture and direct that moisture into drainage ditches or creeks and eventually into rivers. Past Hall Creek Bridge on 450 North, there is another district school turned into a house. This was once known as the Steinbarger School, named for the family who owned the land at the turn of the 20th century. Some of the children who attended this school lived just down the road in this once thriving town of Nortonburg. This map from 1900 shows Nortonburg on the railroad line and the Steinbarger School down the road. Nortonburg was on the Columbus, Hope, and Greensburg line that connected Columbus to Cincinnati. In 1886, six trains passed through the town each day, four freight trains and two passenger trains. There was also a depot, a general store, a blacksmith, and a sawmill. Nortonburg was named after the Norton family who lived in the area. William Norton founded Nortonburg and operated a huckster wagon, which was a wagon full of various goods driven from farm to farm to allow families to purchase what they needed without going to town. He stocked his wagon from the trains passing through the town and covered a 7 to 10 mile radius from the depot. William's son Ephraim became postmaster of the post office and Ephraim's wife Matilda ran the general store. Growing up in Nortonburg, Ephraim and Matilda's sons attended the Steinberger School down the road. One of these sons was Overton Norton, who grew up at the turn of the 20th century in the house just west of the sign and who lived to be 92 years old. This is a photo of Overton Norton as a young boy in front of the general store. Small town general stores had almost everything someone might need. Coffee, sugar, flour, hardware, plus fabrics, and even some items like cups and coffee pots. This general store also had the only phone in town at a time when phones were brand new and too expensive for individual homes. To make or receive a phone call, the people of Nortonburg used the phone on the wall in the general store. And when a call came in, it was Overton's job to run to that person's house to tell them to come to take the call. Once the railroad stopped running through Nortonburg, the town gradually faded away. Nortonburg's post office closed in 1912. Today, not much is left of the town but a few houses and an old railroad sign that marks where the railroad tracks once ran. Across Bartholomew County, Indiana, and the United States, many people made the transition from living in small rural communities to living in more urban settings throughout the 20th century. And yet, some small towns have survived, some perhaps smaller than before, but holding on to their sense of community by retaining historic names or structures or creating a monument to a past person or place. Although areas of Flat Rock Township, including Cormantown, Clifford, and Nortonburg, look much different than they did in the past, the change took place slowly over time. On the other hand, one area of northern Bartholomew County changed very significantly, quickly, and intentionally due to global influences. In 1941, as World War II was raging around the world, the U.S. government was searching for an area in Indiana to construct a large military training camp. 40,000 acres were selected in northwest Bartholomew County, including all of Nineveh and Union Townships, along with small parts of Brown County and Johnson County. This map shows all of the landowners in Nineveh and Union Townships a few years prior to World War II. With one month's notice to relocate, 500 families living in the region were forced to sell their farms and homes, including 402 Bartholomew County families. 11 of 15 cemeteries in the area were relocated. The tiny town of Kansas, population 13, disappeared. Camp Atterbury opened in 1942 and changed the map of Bartholomew County forever. Camp Atterbury was named for William Wallace Atterbury, a Hoosier who became a Brigadier General in the United States Army during World War I. In addition to training over 275,000 American soldiers, Camp Atterbury housed a large prisoner of war compound and a huge military hospital. Between 12,000 and 15,000 Italian and German prisoners of war were housed here during the war, and Wakeman General Hospital treated over 85,000 casualties from 1944 to 1945. Many local residents worked as civilians at Camp Atterbury. 
The camp was deactivated in 1946 after World War II had ended, but then reactivated several times in the following two decades as the United States military became involved in other conflicts. From the 1970s to the 1990s, Camp Atterbury was an Army National Guard training site providing support to the Indiana National Guard. Today, Atterbury primarily provides military training and serves as a mobilization site for the United States military, and it provides an economic boost to Bartholomew County. Another area of Bartholomew County was permanently altered due to World War II and the development of Camp Atterbury. The U.S. military needed a landing field for Camp Atterbury, and in 1942, the government began surveying land on the northern edge of Columbus Township and into Flat Rock Township to build an airport. Fourteen farm families were forced to relocate, and Atterbury Airfield opened in 1943. The airfield served as a training facility for B-25 and B-26 bombers and for gliders. It was also used as a landing field for hospital planes bringing soldiers to Wakeman Hospital at Camp Atterbury. Located just 30 miles north of Freeman Field in Jackson County, where the famed Tuskegee Airmen were stationed, Atterbury Air Base also played a significant role in the training of the first black American bomb squadron. Over 130 buildings were located on the airfield property, and one of the original buildings, which still stands today, is the historic Air Base Chapel, restored and named in honor of Jean Llewellyn Norbeck. Norbeck was born and raised in Columbus and graduated from Columbus High School in 1929. She and her husband Edward were living in Hawaii when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941 and the United States entered World War II. Edward volunteered for the Army and Jean became one of the first women to serve as a military pilot when she joined the WASP, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots. Norbeck was one of only 1,074 women to successfully complete the training. In 1944, Norbeck was tragically killed in a training accident in South Carolina. In 1954, the name of the airfield was changed to Bacaller Air Force Base in honor of Lieutenant John Edmund Bacaller from Hammond, Indiana, who was shot down over France during World War II. The U.S. military closed Bacaller Air Base in 1970, but just two years later, in 1972, the airport was purchased by the city of Columbus for $1, and the name was changed to the Columbus Municipal Airport. Today, Columbus Municipal Airport is the fourth busiest airport in Indiana and a significant transportation resource that boosts the local economy and helps Columbus attract businesses and jobs. In 2019, the airport had over 50,000 operations, including 3,600 military operations in cooperation with nearby Camp Atterbury. The airport is crucial for local businesses transporting goods and personnel and provides a $650 million financial impact on the city of Columbus. Today, much of the northern area of Bartholomew County remains an agricultural region, but Camp Atterbury and the Columbus Municipal Airport have their own important history. The Atterbury Bacaller Air Museum, located at the airport, shares the history of Camp Atterbury, Bacaller, and those men and women who trained and worked here during World War II, during Korean and Vietnam Wars, and today. After the Northwest Territory was established in 1787, increasing numbers of settlers arrived in the area that would eventually become Indiana. The state was settled from south northward with most early towns located near the Ohio River. Over the next century, many people came for the cheap and abundant land, and many moved here because of their religion. Bartholomew County was no exception. Old Union Church in German Township was founded by Christians from Virginia and North Carolina. German Lutherans settled around White Creek in the southwest part of the county. The first Methodist Episcopal Circuit and the first Methodist Church in Bartholomew County were established in Flat Rock Township in 1821, the same year the county was founded. Much of eastern Bartholomew County was also settled in great part by groups of people who arrived and quickly started church communities. Often, towns sprang up around these early churches. In Hall Creek Township, the oldest church community was the Old St. Louis Methodist Episcopal Church, founded in 1829. Old St. Louis is an unincorporated area northwest of Hope that was founded in 1836 and was the same size as Hope for a short time. 
Two other very early Methodist churches in eastern Bartholomew County were the church in Petersville in Clay Township, founded in 1850, and the church in New Bern in Clifty Township, founded in 1859. Petersville was located on the Hope Pike, which today is East 25th Street. New Bern was located further east and north on the road to Hartsville, which is today State Road 46 East. While neither Petersville nor New Bern was ever incorporated, both communities had their own post offices in the late 19th century, and both Methodist church congregations survive and remain active. In Hawkery Township, although the first settlers were Methodist, the township was shaped by the development of Hope, which was founded by a group of Moravians, and which is the second largest town in Bartholomew County. The Moravian Church is one of the oldest Protestant denominations in the world. Founded in Eastern Europe in 1457, early Moravians were persecuted for protesting for change in the Roman Catholic Church. In the 1700s, many Moravian worshipers found refuge in modern-day Germany. Beginning in the 1730s, Moravians began arriving in America as missionaries, with the primary goal of spreading their religious teachings to Native Americans. Moravian American communities were called economies because they were organized to raise money for the missions. The two largest economies in America were in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania and Salem, North Carolina. The Moravians who came to Hall Creek Township were the first immigrants with German heritage in Bartholomew County. In the 1820s, Martin Hauser, a Moravian farmer from North Carolina, visited his brother who was living as a squatter in northern Bartholomew County in the Hall Patch, which was the area between the Flat Rock River and Hall Creek. Martin Hauser recognized the value of the fertile farmland, and in the fall of 1829, his family and five other Moravian families moved from Salem, North Carolina, across the Appalachian Mountains in wagons to settle in Hall Creek Township. With the support of the Moravian Church, Hauser purchased land for the expansion of the denomination into the Midwest, and Hope was founded in 1830 as a Moravian settlement. Originally known as Goshen, the name was changed to Hope in 1834, when the post office was established to avoid confusion with another town in northern Indiana. The first church service of the Hope Moravian community took place in the summer of 1830. Martin Hauser eventually became the pastor of the church and served the congregation until 1847. Hauser later founded several other Moravian congregations during his lifetime, including another church in Bartholomew County called Enon Church near Clifty Creek and others in Indianapolis and Illinois. Today, the Hope Moravian Church is the only remaining Moravian church in Indiana. Over the years, the Hope Moravian Church has had three buildings. The first was a log structure on land that would become the Hope Town Square. The building was not finished in time for the first service in June of 1830, and to provide shade on the roofless structure, leafy branches were placed across the top. A commemorative rock on the north side of the Hope Town Square marks the location of this first building. The second church was located on Main Street on current church property. It is seen on the left in this photo. It was a wood frame structure with a cupola. When the church outgrew the building in the 1870s, a larger, more permanent brick structure was built north of the older church and the church parsonage. The third church building was finished in 1874, and although the exterior of the tower has changed slightly, the building appears much as it did over 100 years ago and still has an active congregation. Martin Hauser left Hope before this building was constructed to start a new church in West Salem, Illinois. He came back to Hope for the building's dedication and died while he was here. He is buried in West Salem. The frame church building remained standing for many years until it was torn down in 1954. This bell tower with the church's original bell stands on the grounds to commemorate the site of the second church building. Because Moravians were such an early Protestant denomination, they are credited with many firsts in worship. Moravians introduced music into services and wrote and used the first hymn book. They introduced the Love Feast, which is a simple meal celebrating unity and faith in church. In addition, the Moravians were the first to use the sunrise service as part of Easter celebrations. Moravians had very progressive ideas regarding education as well. They believed in educating all including young children and girls. The Moravians supported kindergarten and locally had a boarding school for teenage girls known as the Hope Moravian Seminary. Young ladies from all over the Midwest came here to live and go to school. The seminary stood on a hill across the road from the church as seen in this early map. 
The gates at the bottom of the hill on the church property today are a memorial to the Hope Moravian Seminary, which once stood across the street. The seminary was open from 1866 to 1891. After financial difficulties led to its closing, the building was used for almost 20 years for a different kind of school, a two-year college offering teacher training, business, science, and the arts, called the Hope Normal and Business School. The Hope Normal School operated between 1880 and 1898, and many local teachers of the day received their training in Hope. After the Normal School also closed for financial reasons, the building was torn down and the land divided and sold as residential lots. As with most churches, the Hope Moravian Church reserved space for a cemetery from the beginning. The oldest part of the original Moravian Cemetery is called God's Acre. In the 1870s, the Moravian Seminary principal and teacher, Reverend Francis Holland, planted huge, graceful Norwegian blue spruce trees behind the church at the entrance of the cemetery. The alleyway of trees was called the Avenue of Spruce and was used during the traditional Moravian Easter sunrise service, a tradition that continues today. The congregation meets inside the sanctuary before dawn and follows the brass choir or band out the doors through the tree-lined path to the God's Acre where the worship service concludes. After 150 years, the original majestic trees were not in good shape, and the church removed them with plans to plant new trees along the avenue. God's Acre dates to 1833 when the first burial occurred of a three-year-old child. The traditional Moravian cemetery looks much different than many other cemeteries. The Moravians believe that all people are equal in the eyes of God at death, and for that reason, all the grave markers are flat so as to not attract attention to any one stone or individual. Additionally, God's Acre is not organized by families, but instead by Moravian social and peer groups, which were called choirs. There were sections for married men, married women, unmarried men, unmarried women, boys and girls, and a potter's field, which was a burial ground for the poor. Other Moravian churches also called their cemeteries God's Acre, and larger God's Acre cemeteries can be found in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and Old Salem, North Carolina, where the first Moravian communities in America were established. Although Hope was founded as a Moravian community in 1836, the town opened up to non-Moravians when plots of land were put up for sale at public auction. Like many other small towns, Hope was laid out around an open public square with businesses surrounding that square. The Hope Town Square is visible in this 1870s era map of Hope. Since the town's founding, the square has long been a gathering spot, as seen in this early 20th century photo. Another feature on many small town squares was the bandstand. In Hope in the 1920s, the volunteer town band would give free concerts from the bandstand on Saturday nights. Many residents would come into town to hear the band and visit with friends and neighbors. It was considered a huge honor to be in the town band, and members wore uniforms and observed a strict moral code. The Yellow Trail Museum is across State Road 9 from the square. This is the History Museum of Hope and the surrounding area and includes the bed in which Martin Hauser died, a model of the Moravian Girls Seminary, and vintage green wool uniforms with yellow trim worn by the Hope Town Band. The Yellow Trail name harkens back to a local business's famous marketing campaign. Across the square on the south side is a building with a limestone block dated 1915. This was the location of Spa's Garage, an early automobile repair shop. As a form of advertising to local businesses, Elda Spa painted a yellow band at eye level on all the telephone poles along the roads leading to Hope. Motorists could follow the yellow trail to his business. Mr. Spall sold his three-section garage in 1936, but the Yellow Trail legacy he created lives on. The Yellow Trail Museum also includes a tribute to rural mail delivery. In 1896, Hope was one of the first towns in the United States to experiment with mail delivery to individual homes located out in the country. Before rural free mail delivery, farm families came to town to pick up their mail at the post office. For some, this might mean they would get their mail only once a week or maybe once a month. The rural free delivery experiment tested the idea of delivering mail free of charge to each county household. It was a popular success, and for over 125 years, 
People who live in the country and the city have had mail delivered to their neighborhoods and homes. Norman's Funeral Home in the southwest corner across State Road 9 from the square is the oldest business in Hope owned continuously by one family. In 1865, sawmill owner E.A. Norman began making coffins as a service to the community. The funeral home is still a Norman family business five generations later and is located in a two-story brick building built in 1901. This log cabin located just off the Hope Town Square was built near Hartsville in 1837 by Christian Spaw. The Norman family moved it to this location in the 1970s to celebrate the heritage of the area. The architectural style of the cabin is single pen log construction built with hewn logs in a one room rectangular structure with a sleeping loft above. Just south of Hope on the campus of Hope Elementary and Hauser Junior Senior High School stands a tribute to local history that is keeping history alive for children to experience learning in a one room schoolhouse. Welcome to Simmons School where the present meets the past. This district school was located three miles northwest of Hope and was built in 1879. Students came to class here grades one through eight until 1906. It was always a passion of former superintendent Glenn Keller to restore a one-room schoolhouse so that students could step back in time and spend the day. So in 1988, the Hauser historians began to document dilapidated one-room schoolhouses in this area, and they fell in love with this one. This was the one to be relocated and restored. The fundraising began with elementary school children bringing in one dollar to move the school one foot, and the whole community joined in so that by September the 19th, 1989, the Simmons School rolled down State Road 9 to this very location, and it was a glorious day. Barb Johnson and the One Room Schoolhouse Committee continued to raise funds, there were a lot of ice cream socials, until we were able to restore this building to its former grandeur. Now students come from all over the state, stepping across this threshold and listening to the peal of the bell of the original one room schoolhouse. Will you join me? When students come to Simmons School, they're immersed in the 1892 school day. They come in costume, they bring an old fashioned lunch in a lunch pail, they practice ciphering on a slate and read from McGuffey's readers. They like to write with a flare with pen and ink. At noontime, they shoot marbles and walk on stilts and sometimes play Andy Over, where they kick the ball over the schoolhouse. There were 45 students registered to Simmons School and no one had to walk more than two miles to get here. Older children taught younger children, and somehow they managed to get through it, including orthography and physiology. The teachers were women, and they were also responsible for maintenance of the building. It was not unusual to see students carrying coal or cleaning lamp chimneys. When the Hauser historians did oral history with people who had gone to one-room schoolhouses, they learned some interesting things. They learned that the district scholar was responsible for their own learning. They learned too that they were lucky to get to go to school. Many students had to stay home and help with the harvest or with that new baby. They learned that recess was the best and that programs and socials were attended by the entire community and the teacher was an important part of that community. In 1957, Flat Rock and Haw Creek townships consolidated to build a junior-senior high. They named that junior-senior high after the town's founder from the 19th century, Martin Hauser. The mascot chosen? The Contemporary Jets. Flat Rock and Hall Creek Townships are the only Bartholomew County Townships with their own school corporation. The Flat Rock Hall Creek School Corporation consists of one school complex located just south of Hope on State Road 9 
and including Hope Elementary and Hauser Junior Senior High School. When the consolidation occurred in 1957, it brought together students from Clifford, Hartsville, and Hope. Southeast of Hope and Simmons School lies Schaefer Lake, a 100-acre private residential community created in the late 1950s. Albert Schaefer hoped to develop a water sports recreation area near Hope after a family vacation in Minnesota. Schaefer purchased flood land from several local farmers, cleared the trees, and built a dam on Duck Creek. By 1959, the lake was full, and the following year, a bathhouse was constructed and a public beach created with truckloads of sand. For many years, people flocked to the beach in warm weather. As the beach became popular, Schaefer developed some of the land around the lake into residential lots. In the early 1980s, the beach was closed in order to construct more homes on the open lots. Today, Schaefer Lake is home to about 100 residences. Southwest of Hope and Schaefer Lake, just off State Road 9, is a cemetery which connects Bartholomew County to the American Revolution. Sharon Cemetery is located in the northeast corner of Clay Township, north of Clifty Creek. Once there was a church here as well, Sharon Baptist Church, which was the earliest church founded in the area in 1823. The church is now gone, but the cemetery remains. Here, in a quiet country graveyard, lie the remains of Jonathan Moore, who fought in the American Revolution. Moore was born in New York, but lived in Bartholomew County later in life. In 1776, Jonathan Moore was a member of an elite group of soldiers who served as bodyguards for General George Washington. Members of this prestigious lifeguard had to be young, active, and well-made and stand between 5 feet 8 inches and 5 feet 10 inches tall. Washington was 6 feet 3 inches tall, and the historians believe Washington wanted to stand tall on the battlefield above all men, including those who were guarding his life. The lifeguards wore buckskin breeches, blue coats, and black felt hats and came from all 13 original states. They were present with Washington at all of his Revolutionary War battles and were paid $6.60 a month. And Jonathan Moore fought at Monmouth and Valley Forge and he was present at the surrender at Yorktown. After the war, Moore retired to Bartholomew County where he was a popular figure in military and history celebrations in Bartholomew County. He lived to the age of 99. His original tombstone is still present in Sharon Cemetery with a weeping willow tree engraved on it. Today there is a second newer grave marker behind the old one, which is easier to read. Jonathan Moore Pike, the main road in and out of Columbus on the west side of town, is named for this Revolutionary War veteran. Just down the road from Sharon Cemetery is the Enon Cemetery. The Enon Church Located southwest of Hope was the second local Moravian congregation founded by Martin Hauser, who preached the first sermon in German in April of 1844. The church building itself was not constructed until 1846. The congregation eventually dwindled and joined the Hope Moravian Church in 1926. The church building then stood empty for 50 years until it was burned down by vandals in 1976. A small sign explains the history of the church and the stone foundation of the structure and remnants of the Enon Cemetery pay tribute to its past. Northeast from the Enon Cemetery near the eastern edge of Bartholomew County is the town of Hartsville. Hartsville is another small town that is built around a public square. Located in Hall Creek and Clifty Townships near the Decatur County line, Hartsville was founded in 1832. Hartsville has had a post office since 1838 and the town has had several famous historical connections. On the Hartsville Town Square is a historic marker celebrating an important Civil War veteran who is buried north of town. His name was Private Barton Mitchell. In the fall of 1862, Mitchell's Union Army Regiment was camping near Frederick, Maryland in an area that had been previously occupied by Confederate troops. After dinner, Mitchell and a fellow soldier noticed something on the ground, a piece of paper wrapped around three cigars. The two men turned in their find to their superior officers. The paper was a copy of Special Order 191, Confederate General Robert E. Lee's detailed plan for the movement of Confederate troops. This information gave the Union a major advantage and allowed Union generals to adjust their strategy based on what Lee was planning. Two battles immediately followed Mitchell's finding of Lee's lost orders, the Battle of South Mountain and the Battle of Antietam the bloodiest battle in all of Civil War history. 
Over 33,000 men died at Antietam, and it is considered a turning point in the Civil War, which led to President Abraham Lincoln issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Mitchell was discharged after he was severely wounded in the Battle of Antietam and came to live in Hartsville, where his wife had moved with her family. He died in 1868 and is buried in a quiet cemetery northwest of the town near Clifty Creek. Mike Hope, Hartsville once had an institute of higher learning called Hartsville College. It began as Hartsville Academy, a two-story frame school started by the town as a public school in 1850, but the United Brethren Church took it over for financial reasons a short time later. A rock monument and plaque commemorate the school's original location near the center of the square. Around 1865, a new, larger brick building was built on a campus on the south side of town. One of the more interesting stories about Hartsville College is the famous family associated with the school. Both parents of the Wright brothers, inventors of the airplane, attended Hartsville College. Susan and Milton Wright met in Hartsville as students in 1853. After the Wrights were married, they initially lived elsewhere and had several children. In 1868, Milton Wright took a job at Hartsville College and the family returned to Bartholomew County. Milton served as the presiding elder and pastor of the local church and professor of theology at Hartsville College from 1868 to 1869. Wilbur Wright was born in 1867 near Millville, Indiana before the Wrights moved to Bartholomew County, but lived in Hartsville with his family as a young child. About a year later, the family moved to Dayton, Ohio, where Orville was born. Hartsville College was one of the first co-educational institutions of higher learning in the United States, educating both men and women. Several local prominent citizens either taught or attended here. One of these was Samuel Wirtz, who taught at Hartsville College and was the longest-serving principal of Columbus High School. He also played a role in the founding of Indiana Central College, now called the University of Indianapolis. Lucretia Shuck Kondo graduated from Hartsville College and became a Latin teacher and dean of girls at Columbus High School. Hartsville College closed in 1897, but faculty and alumni were loyal and held reunions into the mid-20th century. The brick building burned down shortly after the school shut down. The grassy plaza of the campus is now residential, but a sign that reads College Street remains there. There's also a cemetery where many of the students and teachers are buried. South of Hartsville in Clifty Township is Anderson Falls, a spectacular Bartholomew County geologic feature which has been popular with locals for over 150 years. The falls are located on the Fall Fork of Clifty Creek near the Decatur County line. Although it was well known by locals for more than a century, Anderson Falls was dedicated as a county park in 1983 with hiking trails that cover 44 acres. This area was once occupied by Native Americans. In the 19th century, David Anderson ran a grist mill near the falls downstream, and the area is named for Anderson and his family. A small town called Camden was also once located here. It was planted south and east of the falls early in the 1800s by men who discovered a mineral spring nearby and felt this water source warranted a town. However, Camden never developed, and by the middle of the 19th century, it was gone. By the early 20th century, the mills were gone, but the area was a popular place for local youth to gather. Anderson Falls is 50 feet across and 13 feet high. At various times throughout the year, the view of the falls is quite different, depending on how much water is flowing. In the spring, visitors can see beautiful early wildflowers, and the entire creek bed is blooming with bluebells. With spring rains, the falls become quite spectacular. Even the frozen falls in the winter are a sight to behold. When the creek is dry, it's easy to see the geology of the area, which is caused by the same geologic features that are found at the famous Niagara Falls. The top layer of rock is hard limestone over soft shale that easily breaks and wears away, leaving the layer of hard limestone exposed and unsupported. Big chunks of limestone eventually break off into the creek below, and for this reason, the entire falls is slowly eroding upstream. While Anderson Falls is open year-round, there is no bridge over the creek, so visitors must walk through the creek to access the park's hiking trails, a feat which is dangerous with significant water flowing. 
In the 1960s and 70s, the falls were threatened by a plan for a dam and reservoir which would have flooded the area and hidden the falls forever. Planning began in the 1960s to create the Clifty Creek Reservoir by damming the creek south of the falls. The plan was intended to decrease flooding and to create a larger lake for residential and recreational use. Planners projected 200,000 visitors a year might visit the area. In preparation, the town of Hartsfield spent a large amount of money in 1970 on a sewer system they would be able to handle the additional homes. When the federal funding for the project disappeared and many local citizens protested the environmental cost, the project was eventually abandoned. And as a result, the town of Hartsfield suffered financially. And the town's incorporation charter was almost revoked in 1981 as it struggled to pay its bills. The town survived in the end and the natural beauty of the falls was preserved. The southeastern part of Bartholomew County, south of Anderson Falls, has an interesting claim to fame. Although this area is not at the center of the county, it was the center of the United States population in 1900. Since 1790, the U.S. government has conducted a census of all residents every 10 years. Part of the calculation of the data includes identifying the location of the mean center of population. This is the point at which the U.S. population is equal both north, south, east, and west. At the time of the first census, the mean center of population was in Maryland, and it has moved steadily west across the United States every 10 years. In 1900, the center of population was located on Henry Mars Farm near the border of Rock Creek and Columbus Townships. A granite marker was dedicated the following year to commemorate the spot for the public. Eventually, it was moved but it is still present along State Road 7 in the southeast corner of the county. A smaller stone marker with a simple 1900 inscribed was placed at the exact location of the center of population at the time and remains in place on private property. Rock Creek Township includes the small unincorporated communities of Burnsville and Grammar. Burnsville was founded in 1845 and had 200 residents near the end of the 19th century. Grammar was founded in 1890 after the railroad was built from Elizabethtown to Westport in Decatur County. Grammar was originally known as Cushman or Springer, and not until 1893 was the name changed for good. In the early 20th century, both Burnsville and Grammar had two-room brick schoolhouses, but neither had enough students to have a separate high school. Instead, they alternated which school housed the high school students from both communities until 1924, when all high school students began attending Columbus High School. The Burnsville School is still standing and has been repurposed as a home. The Grammar School, which was designed in 1899 by prominent local architect Charles Sparrow, continued to be used as an elementary until 1958 when a new Rock Creek Elementary was built. The old building was torn down in 1998 and the land converted to a county park with a stone memorial to the school. During World War II, Grammar had a brief moment of fame when the Grammar Auxiliary Flying Field was established as one of five auxiliary landing fields for military pilots who were training at Freeman Field in Jackson County. Two of the five landing fields were located in Bartholomew County, including this one near Grammar and one near Walesboro in Wayne Township. Four farm families living in Rock Creek Township were given just two months in the fall of 1942 to vacate their land for the construction of three grass runways. In contrast to Camp Atterbury and the Atterbury Bacolor Airport, the Grammar Flying Field was not used for long and was sold for surplus in 1945 and eventually returned to farming. A significant recreational complex was added to Western Rock Creek Township in 1963 by Cummins Engine Company. It was called Sarah Land, the Cummins Employee Recreation Association and was built on the former 345-acre Keller Farm as a corporate facility for Cummins employees and their families. In 2014, the park opened to public membership when Cummins turned the park over to a nonprofit managing company. Services often include camping, rental cabins, an aquatic center, and an indoor sports complex. The grounds include a number of outdoor boarding facilities, and Sarah Land hosts many special events every year, including popular fireworks shows on the 4th of July. The eastern part of the county is a mostly rural area, but the stories from Hope and Hartsville, from area churches and schools, and from the many people who have called this region home are all part of the rich history of Bartholomew County that connects us all.
Agriculture has always been an integral part of Bartholomew County's economy and growth. Corn, soybeans, and wheat are staples, but other crops like tomatoes, cucumbers, and pumpkins are grown as well. Across the southern part of Bartholomew County in Sand Creek and Wayne Townships, the county's rural landscape is evident. After Bartholomew County was founded in 1821, Sand Creek and Wayne Townships were the first to be organized, and they were in place before the end of that year. Both townships were originally larger than they are today. Some of the area's earliest known history occurred in this area. For example, this farm in Sand Creek Township today was once the home of a pre-contact Native American community from 3,000 years ago. Pre-contact Native Americans lived in the region before European settlers. Archaeologists working in the 1970s found the oldest house patterns in Indiana on the Wint Farm in Sand Creek Township. A house pattern is evidence in the soil of a home that once stood in this location. While the house is long gone, there are stains in the soil left from the structure that rotted away over time. The three house patterns that were discovered here show that these homes had an overlapping circular shape. This diagram shows how the soil markings appeared. The houses were built from bent wooden poles, covered in thatch or hides, and after the discovery, archaeologists built a model to show what the structure might have looked like. Because the houses did not have a direct entrance, historians believe the small family band lived here in the winter months, and the guarded entrance kept out the cold air. The people were seasonably mobile following food sources. In addition to the stains in the soil left by the rotting posts of the homes, archaeologists found fire pits, small bird points, and charred hickory nuts. This Riverton culture group actually cultivated the hickory nut trees growing along the east bank of the East Fork of White River and ate small game, birds, and shellfish. Under the direction of an archaeology professor from Indiana State University and local amateur archaeologist, many volunteers were used to excavate the site from 1977 to 1979. Near the Wint site in the southern part of Sand Creek Township lies the town of Azalea. This area was settled by members of the Society of Friends, often known as Quakers. Many of these settlers arrived from North Carolina in the 1820s and in the 30s. One early Quaker family to settle in Sand Creek Township was the David Newsom family, and their farm played an interesting role in the development of the state. After Indiana achieved statehood in 1816, Corridon had served as the state capital from 1816 to 1824. This early 1820 state map illustrates both Indiana's development from the south northwards and the difficulty with maps while the state was growing quickly, as it shows New Marion County but no Bartholomew County, when in fact Bartholomew County was founded first. This close-up of the same map shows the central location of Corridon in Harrison County just north of the Ohio River. Since the state developed from the south, Corridon was a logical location for the first state capital. In late 1824, the decision was made to move the capital to Indianapolis, which was more centrally located. The state treasurer, Samuel Merrill, loaded up his family along with the state's records and the state's assets and traveled in one wagon pulled by four horses to the new capital. It was 132 miles from Corridon to Indianapolis and took two weeks to travel that distance. The state's currency was all in silver at the time and was kept in a chest in the wagon. Merrill and his family stopped and stayed at homes along the way, with members of the party reportedly taking turns sleeping with the silver to protect it. The group spent one night at the David Newsom farm in Sand Creek Township. Because the state's official papers were located in Azalea that night, locals claimed that Bartholomew County once was the state capital. This historic marker today identifies where Newsom's home once stood. Sand Creek Township became an important regional transportation link in the 19th century. Early roads in Indiana were often just rough lanes cut through the woods, and so transportation by foot and horseback was difficult and slow. As early as 1828, the town of Azalea had a stagecoach stop, and stagecoaches were four-wheeled carriages pulled by two or four horses that were used to transport people from place to place. Travelers could make the journey from Madison to Indianapolis through Azalea and Columbus. The fare was six and one quarter cents per mile with 15 pounds of free baggage for a cost of just under three dollars between Madison and Columbus. This circa 1830 map shows two roads connecting Bartholomew County to towns to the south 
including an important route that connected Columbus to Madison, Indiana, and crossed Rock Creek and Sand Creek Township east of Azalea. This road, which eventually became State Road 7, was once known as the Madison Road. After statehood in 1816, Hoosiers and new settlers needed roads to get from the more populated southern part of Indiana to the interior of the state, which was mostly unsettled. Two early roads were cut from the Ohio River to Indianapolis. The first of these roads was completed in 1824 and was called the Mox Ferry Road. It began at Mockport, which was a river town south of Corydon. The Madison Road was completed one year later in 1825, originating in Madison. This 1835 map is one of the earliest Indiana road maps. Both the Mox Ferry and Madison Roads can be seen traveling through Bartholomew County and Columbus. The Madison Road had an additional importance to many farmers in Bartholomew County because it was used for driving hogs to market, an important part of pioneer life in the early 19th century in much of the Midwest. Farmers who raised hogs had to get their hogs to market to be sold. Before the arrival of the railroad in the 1840s and 50s, farmers would band their hogs together and drive them to slaughterhouses in Madison, Indiana on the Ohio River. The hog drivers on foot would be accompanied by men on horseback and in wagons. Covering about eight miles a day, getting to Madison would take a week or so, depending on where in the county they started. Taverns, or eight-mile houses, were built along the way for overnight accommodations for travelers and included pens for the hogs. Most hog drives were in the early winter before the ground froze hard as the packing houses operated only in the winter months. After arriving in Madison, the hogs were slaughtered and the meat was sent downstream to New Orleans by boat. Not until the 1860s did Columbus have its own stockyard and pork processing plant. As Sand Creek Township's importance as a transportation link was growing for horse and stagecoach traffic, the town of Azalea was planted in 1831. Like Hope and Hartsville, Azalea had a public square. As shown in this 1879 map, Azalea had a store and post office across from the public square. The post office was opened in 1833 and survived until 1934. Azalea had a busy shipping port down Boat Street that was contributing to the growth for many years. Back then, the East Fork of the White River was navigable to the Ohio River. Farmers brought produce, lumber, and livestock to sell downstream. Flatboats would sometimes travel on to New Orleans. Although most businesses in Azalea are now gone, Azalea has a grain elevator on the south side of town for the agricultural business nearby. The public square is now a park, and the old general store and post office building, visible in the background, is now converted to a house. Transportation throughout Bartholomew County and all of Indiana changed dramatically with the arrival of the railroad in the 1840s. Construction of the first railroad in Indiana began in September of 1836 in Madison, which was an important center of commerce on the banks of the Ohio River. The steep and beautiful hills that surrounded Madison made construction of the railroad to the north very difficult and required cutting through solid rock. Once completed, the Madison Incline was among the steepest railroad grades in the United States. It took a total of seven years before the tracks were completed from Madison to southeast Bartholomew County in 1843. Elizabethtown was platted as the first stop along the railroad within the county. Then it took 10 more months for the railroad to extend 7.5 miles further north to Columbus and three more years to reach Indianapolis. In total, construction of the line from Madison to Indianapolis lasted 11 years. Less than 10 years after the Madison and Indianapolis line brought railroad travel to Bartholomew County, the Jeffersonville and Indianapolis line was constructed further west. This time, the railroad came from due south and made its first Bartholomew County stop in the Wayne Township town of Jonesville, which was planted by Benjamin Jones in 1851. Smith Jones, son of Jonesville's founder, became the first postmaster the following year when the Jonesville Post Office was established, and later he would serve as the first mayor of Columbus after the city was incorporated in 1864. By 1900, Jonesville was a bustling town with three trains daily between Jeffersonville and Indianapolis. One of the oldest establishments in Jonesville is still standing today, the Jonesville Tavern, known affectionately as The Brick. The building was built in 1903 on the site of a tavern that had burned a few years before. Today, Jonesville and Elizabethtown, early Bartholomew County towns that sprang up due to the railroad's arrival, still exist. 
but they face challenges as small rural towns. Jonesville population over more than 160 years has remained largely the same, close to 200 inhabitants. The loss of its post office in 2011 was a big blow to the town, but a variety of businesses and churches remain. Elizabethtown's population is more than double that of Jonesville and double its size in the late 19th century. Elizabethtown has active churches, along with a grain elevator to serve the agricultural community. The town's post office has been open since 1844, and one of the oldest school buildings in Bartholomew County still stands in Elizabethtown. The Greek Revival School building was built in 1869. It once had a two-year and four-year high school and later was used as a Masonic Hall and then a residence. After the school was closed in 1915, another school was built northeast of town called the Sand Creek Township School. Today, the site where the township school once stood is a public park. Azalea did not benefit as Elizabethtown and Jonesville did when the railroad first arrived in the county, but in 1889, a regional train between Seymour and Elizabethtown stopped in Azalea. More importantly, Azalea had a stop on the interurban line in the early 20th century. The interurban was an intercity electric train that connected Bartholomew County to Louisville to the south and Indianapolis to the north from about 1900 to 1941. Interurbans were popular in other states, but Indiana had one of the most extensive interurban systems in the country. This 1912 map shows the regular railroad in black and the interurban electric railroad in red. The Irwin family of Columbus invested in both the Interstate Public Service Power Company and the Interurban, which was run by the power company. Interurban tracks generally followed the path of power lines between cities. In 1900, the first interurban opened in Indiana, and in 1903, service began between Indianapolis and Columbus. The Irwins operated the line, which became the Indianapolis, Columbus, and Southern Traction Company, and eventually extended to Louisville through Azalea. Interurbans used existing streetcar tracks within cities and were popular both for their cost and because they could deliver passengers directly downtown and not to the outskirts of town where traditional railroad stations were often located. This map shows the interurban tracks labeled Public Service Company, extending between Azalea and Columbus. While the railroad station in Columbus was located near Millrays Park, the interurban stopped right on Washington Street at 3rd Street, as shown in this photo from the 1920s, with the Bartholomew County Courthouse visible in the background. Although south of Columbus, the interurban tracks and Pennsylvania Railroad tracks took separate routes. North of town, both sets of tracks ran together. This early 20th century photo shows the interurban tracks running down the middle of the view underneath the power lines. As automobile traffic became cheaper and more households owned cars, the interurbans declined in popularity. The last interurban in Indiana closed in 1941. Eventually, the tracks were removed and most evidence of the interurban disappeared. This mid-20th century aerial photo shows Azalea after the interurban tracks were gone, but with the substation visible within the line of utility poles that previously powered the interurban cars. Today, the substation is still standing in the middle of a farm field covered in vegetation. Another important story in the history of Bartholomew County and the United States was a different kind of railroad, the Underground Railroad. Before the Civil War, the economy of southern plantation owners depended on slave labor to cultivate and plant the fields and harvest the crops. Helping slaves escape to freedom was against the law and could result in losing property or going to jail. A secret system developed to help slaves run away to freedom in the North or in Canada, where slavery was illegal. Called the Underground Railroad, it was not a real railroad with trains or tracks. It was a network of secret routes and hiding places established to help slaves escape until they were far enough north that they couldn't be caught and taken back to a slave owner. Men called conductors aided and sheltered the runaways, moving individuals or small groups from one safe house to another. Many of the conductors of the Underground Railroad were members of the Society of Friends, commonly called the Quakers. They practiced civil disobedience. They broke a law that they thought was unjust. And they knew that they could face consequences if caught. They lived by their ideals and they risked being in harm's way for what they thought was right. 
Escaped slaves could cross the Ohio River into Indiana, which was a free state. They would go through Jeffersonville, New Albany, Salem, Seymour, and eventually they could end up here in Sand Creek Township in Bartholomew County. If they made it that far, they might encounter John Hall, a local Quaker and conductor who would keep them safe in an underground room that was uh, accessed through a trap door in his kitchen that was underneath the kitchen rug. John Hall's farm sets up this country lane and just above where the first Quaker church in this community was located. Mr. Hall's church was the Sand Creek Society of Friends. In 1824, it's established. Uh, the first building was a log cabin. It was later removed and made into a frame structure. Shortly thereafter, they built a seminary. The Sand Creek Seminary, for nine years, prepared students to go to Earlham College, which was established in 1847. After nine years, that was closed and the building became a community school. And if you are at the Sand Creek Cemetery, there's a water pump and it would have sat right, right beside that water pump. In 1950, the Sand Creek Church closed because of structural weaknesses and the members joined the church here in the Azalea. It was a good partnership, tremendous partnership. They combined names of the churches. Sand Creek offered some great furniture that they could bring south to Azalea and Azalea offered a solid building structurally and they made it work. John Hall had a neighbor, John Thomas. He was to the west of the cemetery, to the west of Pleasant Hill. John Thomas helped the escaped slaves and the fugitives as well. He hid his passengers in, in the nearby fields and in the river bottoms. And like other conductors, he found a way to get them food. Contrary to the common uh, Quaker traditional colors, Mr. Thomas painted his gate to his farm red so that the slaves would have a visible sign of uh, where safety was. He had a habit of never asking passengers what their name was because he wanted to keep a clear conscience uh, when the slave catchers would come by and ask about a specific slave. When they left his farm, fugitives would travel to East Columbus. There they would follow the tracks of the Cambridge branch of the uh, JM&I Railroad and they would take that uh, all the way to Carthage, Indiana, which was the next Underground Railroad station. A more famous conductor was Levi Coffin, the leader of the Underground Railroad. Levi Coffin bought property in Jackson County uh, that was sat near the uh, Driftwood Quaker meeting. He also is documented to have attended the churches here in Sand Creek Township as well. Several members who were conductors were buried at the Sand Creek Cemetery. John Hall has a simple marker that's just uh, west of the flagpole. Also buried there are James Newsom and John Thomas. And nearby, there's a marker for Thomas Cook, who was a Revolutionary War soldier. We are right now in the Sand Creek Azalea Meeting House. Built in 1875, by 1950, it becomes the single church here in, in Azalea and for Sand Creek Township. It was uh, built the same time the Hope Moravian Church was built, and so you'll see some structural similarities. And like a number of churches in the area, it was built from uh, brick that was actually made here in Azalea. The limestone foundation comes from Jennings County. Not long after Sand Creek Township was settled, a new wave of immigrants came to Southern Bartholomew County in Wayne and Jackson Townships. Beginning in the late 1830s, German immigrants arrived and settled in the White Creek area of Southern Bartholomew County. Over the next several decades, more German settlers came to other parts of Bartholomew County as well. Many of these early settlers were farmers who had toiled in Germany paying rent to wealthy landowners and they came for the economic opportunities in the vast United States. Many of the early German settlers to Bartholomew County were members of a Protestant faith called Lutherans. St. John's White Creek Lutheran Church in Wayne Township was the first German Lutheran congregation in Bartholomew County and was organized in 1840. Within a few years, the congregation had purchased 40 acres for $50 and built a log cabin to serve as a place of worship. In 1862, a new brick structure was built to house the growing congregation. Most of the work was done by congregation members, and the bricks used in construction were made locally. One of the church's co-founders was Johann Heinrich Zerovista, who immigrated from Germany to the United States in 1834 and arrived in the White Creek area by 1840. In the years following his arrival in the United States, Zerovista wrote numerous letters home to his family in Germany. 
31 of which survive and have been published. The letters describe early life in the Midwest and include observations about the United States at the time, including slavery, presidential elections, and the Civil War, seen through the eyes of an immigrant. Sir Uvista is buried in the church cemetery, which is located behind the 1862 building where the St. John's Congregation at White Creek continues to worship. Also located on church property is the White Creek Lutheran School, which was started shortly after the church was founded. Education was especially important to German immigrants, and eventually all German Lutheran churches in the area established schools. Although the buildings have changed, White Creek Lutheran School has been educating children for over 170 years. Two other early German Lutheran churches in the southwest corner of Bartholomew County show the extent of German influence at that time. St. Peter Lutheran in Waymansville and St. Paul's Lutheran in Jonesville. The influence spread into Columbus as well with the founding of St. Paul's Lutheran at Clifty in 1848 and St. Peter's Lutheran in Columbus in 1858. St. John's at White Creek was the original German Lutheran church from which the others were eventually created usually by parishioners who decided to worship closer to where they lived and so created new church communities. Lutherans living in the Waymansville area in the 1840s and 1850s traveled to White Creek or to a Lutheran church in Jackson County before deciding to start their own congregation closer to home. In 1870, they purchased an old Methodist church building and worshiped there for about 10 years before the current brick building was constructed. Today, the Waymansville Church building appears much the same as it did in early years. The altar at the front of the sanctuary was purchased by the church in 1900. St. Paul's Church in Jonesville was formed in 1877 by members of the White Creek Lutheran Church living in the Jonesville area. The church building was constructed in 1893, and like other German Lutheran congregations, all services were initially in German, and the transition to English was gradual. Not until 1942 were all church services performed in English. Lutheran churches were not the only early congregations in southwest Bartholomew County. In 1846, seven German Lutheran families from White Creek organized as a Methodist congregation after being attracted to the enthusiastic Methodist Episcopal circuit riders traveling through the area. White Creek Methodist Church built a small log cabin in Jackson Township in 1850 and a larger frame structure in 1872. Unfortunately, in 1916, a carbide light system exploded and destroyed the church. While no one was injured, only the pews, the pulpit, and the organ were saved. A new church was constructed that year, and today's congregation worships on the same historic wooden pews from the earlier church building. The southwest corner of Bartholomew County is also home to several unincorporated communities. In Jackson Township, Mount Healthy was a small settlement founded in 1843, and consisting of 18 lots perched on a hill. The town's name was chosen because locals believed that the higher ground was healthier as it was removed from the humidity of the lowlands that brought a higher risk of fever and illness. At its peak in 1888, Mount Healthy had approximately 50 residents. Now Mount Healthy consists of just a few homes and a cemetery. One of the 11 current Bartholomew Consolidated Elementary Schools is Mount Healthy Elementary, which sits near the original high ground. North of Mount Healthy in Ohio Township is another unincorporated community called Ogleville. When founded in 1850, the town was called Moore's Vineyard, as shown in this 1879 map. In 1893, the name changed to Ogleville. This map from 1900 shows the town situated a little further north on the road that would someday be State Road 58. John H. Taylor owned much of the land around Ogleville at that time and ran the flour mill and sawmill. Twice a week, he would make the approximately 12-mile trip to Columbus with a wagon full of flour, a trip which took a full day and a wagon pulled by two mules. Difficult road conditions meant slow travel at the start of the 20th century, but today State Road 58 is an important connection between the southwest corner and the rest of the county. In addition to State Road 58, another important north-south road in the western part of the county is State Road 11. North of the communities of White Creek and Jonesville in Wayne Township, State Road 11 follows the railroad tracks that still connect areas south of the county to Columbus and Indianapolis. The road was once known as the Driftwood Valley Pike because the historic name for the East Fork of the White River was the Driftwood River. Eventually, the Driftwood River ended when it joined the Flat Rock River in Columbus to form the East Fork of the White River. 
During much of the 20th century, the road was known as US 31A before becoming State Road 11. Walesboro is located off State Road 11, four miles south of Columbus in Wayne Township, three miles east of Interstate 65. It is an unincorporated town founded in 1851 by John P. Wales, who planted 34 lots and laid out the streets. It was located on the Jefferson, Madison, and Indianapolis Railroad. In 1942, during World War II, the U.S. Army Air Force chose a site west of Walesboro as an auxiliary flying field for Freeman Field in Jackson County. The government purchased 809 acres of land, and 58 residents were forced to move within a month. Dubbed Freeman Field Auxiliary No. 1 Walesboro Field, the military built two 4,500-foot hard surface runways for pilots of multi-engine aircraft in advanced flight training to practice touch-and-go landings and takeoffs. Completed in 1943, it was one of five satellite airfields for Freeman Field, only two of which were paved. The Walesboro Auxiliary Flying Field was declared surplus by the War Department in February of 1946 since it had not been active since the end of World War II in 1945. From 1946 to 1970, the landing field served as the Columbus Municipal Airport and afterwards became a business and industrial park for Arvin Industries, Cummins, Hamilton, Costco, Orsia, and others. Today, State Road 11 travels past the Bartholomew County 4-H Fairgrounds, But in the late 19th century, the road passed the county poor farm, which housed those who were too old or too poor to support themselves. The 160-acre property was a working farm, and residents, who were often called inmates, labored on the farm, which struggled with sometimes unsanitary conditions. In 1959, the poor farm was permanently closed, and Bartholomew County Home for the Agent opened in East Columbus at Illinois and Gladstone. At the same time that the poor farm was being phased out, the site was transitioning to another important county function, home of the county fair. This 1962 topographical map shows the fairgrounds just west of State Road 11, shown in red, and the railroad tracks. The poor farm is still labeled, although it had been abandoned three years earlier. Bartholomew County had held popular fairs off and on since 1852. Early fairs took place at different locations around Columbus and East Columbus, but in 1910, the first permanent fairgrounds opened on 25th Street, just east of Central Avenue. In 1910, 25th Street was outside the city limits, and streetcars carried citizens from town to the fairgrounds. This 1911 postcard shows an unpaved 25th Street running by the new fairgrounds. By 1930, Columbus had grown enough that this map shows the fairgrounds in the top right or northeast corner of the city. The 25th Street Fairgrounds included a large racetrack for harness racing and then eventually auto and motorcycle racing. This photo shows the grandstand at the track in the mid-20th century. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, Columbus continued to grow until the 25th Street Fairgrounds were eventually surrounded by development and left without any room to expand. In this map, the fairgrounds are in light gray with the larger dark gray city limits. In the mid-1950s, the decision was made to move the fairgrounds to an area southwest of the city on what is today State Road 11. The first county fair on the new grounds took place in 1958 in a much larger fairgrounds that is still in use. The surrounding area was rural at the time, but Southside Elementary School and several residential neighborhoods now stand nearby. When the fair moved, a white wooden pagoda, which was the judging stand for popular harness racings and which had stood at every fairground in Bartholomew County Fair history, was left at the 25th Street location. Time took its toll on the old structure until its dilapidated condition forced a decision about its future when the former fairground's property was to be turned into a shopping mall in the 1980s. A group of citizens rallied to save the pagoda, and in 1988, it was moved to the new fairground's where it still stands. During summer, the fairgrounds welcome thousands of people for the Bartholomew County 4-H Fair. Thousands of others visit the fairgrounds for other public and private events throughout the year. West of the fairgrounds, the geography of Harrison, Ohio, and Jackson Township differs from the rest of the county. While there is still farmland, especially in Ohio and Jackson Townships, the western side of Bartholomew County is much hillier and more densely forested than elsewhere in the county. 
This 1960s era topographical map of Columbus and the southwest part of the county records the area's hills and valleys. While Harrison and Ohio townships are today the westernmost part of the county, it was not always this way. Directly west of Bartholomew County is Brown County, which is known for its picturesque landscapes and for Brown County State Park at over 15,000 acres, the largest state park in Indiana. The park is especially popular in the fall when thousands of visitors come to see the colorful fall foliage. Those familiar with Brown County do not often know that most of the area was originally part of Bartholomew County. In the 1820s and early 1830s, Bartholomew County directly bordered Monroe County. In 1836, Brown County was carved out with most of its area coming from Bartholomew County and small pieces from Monroe and Jackson counties. The geography of the western part of the county, especially Harrison Township, led to a unique type of development in the region. Much of this hilly land was not farmable, as evidenced in this 1940s land use map. The areas of western Bartholomew County, colored in black, are labeled rough land unsuited to agriculture. In the mid-20th century, locals and visitors alike realized that the picturesque wooded region would be the ideal location for the development of recreation and vacation properties. In 1935, local industrialist Q.G. Noblet, one of the founders of Arvin Industry, who was known for his interest in forestry and conservation, donated 70 acres of land and money to develop Columbus Youth Camp in Central Harrison Township. The Civilian Conservation Corps built the lakes, trails, and original six cabins. The Civilian Conservation Corps was a national program developed during the Great Depression to relieve unemployment by hiring men to do conservation work across the country. In 1958, the Lowell Engel King family donated another 40 acres to increase the size of youth camp. Today, youth camp is owned by the Foundation for Youth and includes 137 acres with seven miles of trails, a mountain bike trail, challenge courses, and an outdoor amphitheater all of which are used for camps and outdoor learning experiences. Many local adults have fond memories of events at youth camp. QG Noblet had an interest in land management, and he recognized the need to increase housing options for those moving to Bartholomew County to work in local industry. Noblet was also a pioneer in the creation of man-made lakes in the southern Indiana area and was responsible for dramatic changes in Harrison and Ohio townships with a variety of lake developments. He developed Noblet Falls, now called the Lagoons, within the city of Columbus and Harrison Lakes in Harrison Township. Noblet also started the planning for Grandview Lake before his death in 1954. The first West Side Lake addition was Harrison Lakes in central Harrison Township. Planning began prior to 1945, but it was several years before Noblet's vision was realized. First came the opening of the Harrison Lake Country Club in 1947. Noblet then planted the former farmland near the club and the lakes were dug. The lakes remained empty, however, until major rains came in January of 1949 that filled them. Today, 150 homes are located at Harrison Lakes. In 1961, Tamarick's Lake was developed by Bob Simpson. This map of part of Harrison Township shows Tamarick's Lake south of the Harrison Lake development with youth camp to the west. The largest single lake in Bartholomew County is Grandview Lake, which straddles the line between Harrison and Ohio Townships. Noblet envisioned this as a vacation area, selling 3,200 acres of land south of Youth Camp for the creation of a 400-acre lake surrounded by roads and homes. Construction of the dam to create the lake began in 1953, but Noblet died the following year. It took many years to complete the dam with numerous problems with engineering and financing. The road around the lake was completed in the 1970s. Today, there are over 300 home lots with fewer than half the owners living full-time on Grandview. Also on the west side of Columbus, but closer to the town, is the Tipton Lakes development. In the late 1960s, after Harrison and Grandview Lakes were developed, the need for more housing in Columbus had become apparent due to the growth in local industry and the increase in population. Local industrialist J. Irwin Miller purchased 1,200 acres for new neighborhoods west of town, and the area was annexed in 1979 to become part of the city. This 1982 map shows the future Tipton Lakes area colored gray to match the rest of Columbus, but without any lakes present. Harrison Lakes and Grandview Lake are visible. The dam and three lakes were constructed first, along with the initial Tipton Lakes addition neighborhood. Since then, over 1,000 homes have been built in the area. This 2013 map shows the size of Tipton Lakes area at that time, 
and the aerial photo shows one of the lakes in 2020. Over its first 200 years, Bartholomew County has changed dramatically. Initially, settlers were attracted to the rich farmland in the county, and family farms dominated the landscape. Residents developed a sense of community with their neighbors as they worked together to make a living. Gradually, small towns sprung up all over the county. Manufacturing came quickly to the young county, first in the form of various mills to provide grain, wool, wood, and more for pioneer life. Industry then developed to support the agricultural needs both inside and outside of the region. While early industry was scattered around the county, by the end of the 19th century, Columbus, the county seat, was becoming the center of manufacturing as evidenced in the circa 1890 photo of downtown. Around the turn of the 20th century, Columbus was the home of many important companies, including a high-quality furniture maker known around the world. The world's largest tannery producing all manner of leather goods. And a contracting firm building bridges, courthouses and more all over the United States. Just a few years later, Columbus also became the birthplace of a future world-leading diesel engine company. Bartholomew County also produced many individuals who would make their marks both inside and outside of the community, including many members of a single family. This also included men and women who were pioneers in manufacturing, banking, journalism, industry, sports, and more. Some of these stories from the past and present are very well known, and many notable local residents enjoyed years of success within their professions. Today, there are others from Bartholomew County who are early in their careers and yet already making a big impact. Through most of the past 200 years, the population of Bartholomew County outside of Columbus equaled or surpassed the population of Columbus itself. While some small towns were formed and then faded away, many others survived and thrived. Schools, churches, civic groups, family businesses, and more have given small-town county residents a sense of community that persisted even while population shifts moved many away from rural living. Today, Bartholomew County includes a vibrant population of more than 80,000 that has spread out over 400 square miles of city, towns, and farms. Many families have strong roots in the area, and there are numerous local farms that have remained in the same family for 100 years or more. Since the first immigrants arrived in the area from Germany in the county's early years, many international residents have called Columbus home, often sharing their traditions with the rest of the community. Today, international residents and their families support the more than two dozen international companies that provide jobs to over 8,000 residents in Bartholomew County. The area is home to numerous special industries, including machinery and engine manufacturing, and transportation and automotive equipment manufacturing, and more. Several U.S. research and development centers are also located here. All in all, 35% of local employment is in manufacturing, and Columbus and Bartholomew County have won numerous awards for being a top tech and manufacturing region. For more than 200 years, while much has changed, our sense of community as Bartholomew County residents has remained the same. Over the years, we have endured hardship. We have cherished family. Our children have learned together, and they have socialized together. We have worked together, and worshipped and played together. The community has celebrated, and solved problems together. We have competed, and explored new ideas, created new traditions, and celebrated our differences together. As we move into our next 200 years, we can learn from our county's rich history that while many things are ever-changing, our pride and sense of community in being Bartholomew County citizens will continue to tie us together.
For over a century, the Bartholomew County Public Library and the Bartholomew County Historical Society have worked to discover, collect, preserve, and share the stories of the people who made Bartholomew County what it is today. We are indebted to the previous work of individuals who believed, as we do, that the knowledge of our collective history is critical to understanding our present and as a valuable tool for informing the future. People like George Pence, Vida Newsom, Ross Crump, Susanna Jones, Harry McCauley, and Tammy Stone Iorio all made it their life's work to think about the generations who came after and to make sure our history was not lost. No matter if your family has been here since the county's founding in 1821, or if you recently located here, Bartholomew County's story is your story. Be inspired by those that came before you and determine from their struggles and their triumphs what can be your story and how can you make an impact. History is happening every day. Don't let it pass you by. We're very grateful and excited to be a part of this lifelong journey with you.